Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting of the, uh, of the Plan Commission here, the September 10th, 2014 <coughs> meeting. Uh, I am Michael Lay, Chairman of the Commission, and at this time I'd like to introduce uh, <coughs> the members of the Commission uh, who are here this evening. To my far left, uh, Commissioner Henry. <coughs> to my immediate left is uh, Commissioner Culbertson. To my far right is uh, <coughs> Commissioner Berg. And to my immediate right, uh, or, excuse me, C Commissioner Anderson. Um, from city staff this evening, we have uh, Kathy Zerniak. And our first item of business uh, we'll dispense with, <coughs> which is approval of the minutes they're still being worked on from uh, our last meeting. Um, the first item on our agenda this evening is a continuation of a public hearing <coughs> and possible action on consideration of tentative approval of the Oak Knoll Woodlands subdivision, a 16 lot planned uh, preser preservation subdivision. Uh, the 30 acre parcel is located north of Conway Road at the north end of Oak Knoll Road. <coughs> the petition includes four components. The first being a request for a zone change from our five single family residents with a minimum lot size of three acres to our four single family residence district with a minimum lot size of 60,000 square feet. <clears throat> Second component is an application of the planned preservation historic open space overlay district, which allows a reduction in lot size while not exceeding the density allowed by the underlying zoning district for the purposes of preserving open space and natural resources. Third component is a tentative subdivision plat approval. And finally, the fourth component is tentative approval of the associated special use permit. <clears throat> so at this point, I would like to ask uh, members of the commission whether any of you have had any ex parte contacts or conflicts of interest on this matter. No. Seeing none, we will proceed uh, with our agenda. <clears throat> Uh, then item fir the first item then I will call upon petitioner is that <clears throat> Mr. Swanson uh, to uh, to make a presentation based on the submission of uh, revised materials and I would <clears throat> remind you uh, that you have 20 minutes sir <clears throat> at least for the initial presentation <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Plan Commission. Um, I want to be respectful of the 20-minute period, so we've, uh, we, we're prepared to uh, complete our presentation in that time frame. Uh, for the record, my name is Rick Swanson. Uh, I'm president of, uh, or, or a member of RM Swanson LLC. I'm also a member, that, that is also a member of RREF2 hyphen SD Oaks LLC. I apologize, I had to read that because it's not an easy thing to remember. Uh, I'd like to start by saying that i uh, do sort of a qu quick review of our meeting from the 14th and what we presented. The site is a total of 29.67 acres. There are a total of 6.10 acres of wetland. There is an existing man-made pond on the property which will be preserved and enhanced. A new detention pond will be constructed adjacent to the proposed enhanced wetland to create a more natural and aesthetically pleasing result. 58 acres of off-site drainage currently flows through our property to the northeast onto the Conway Golf Course. This historic drainage pattern will not be altered. Comments from the uh, May 14th meeting. At the May, May, excuse me, at the May 14th meeting of the Plan Commission, we listened carefully to public testimony and, and clearly we took many notes. The three key concerns ra raised were density, drainage, and traffic. These are legitimate concerns and they, the very reason we have established ordinances and design guidelines to responsibly control and or limit how a given property is developed. We intend to address each of the primary concerns separately with our consultant team this evening. All the information we will present is based on factual data, careful analysis by our consultants and city staff. <coughs> we have also met with neighborhood representatives to have a more informal dialogue and attempt to find common ground. We are pleased to report that the discussions with neighbors 
has been civil, respectful, and proactive. This is not to suggest that there is a total agreement, but the flow of information has been open and transparent. We were also in receipt of the independent review conducted by Christopher B. Burke Engineering on behalf of the neighbors and pleased to report our plan addresses each of the comments provided in that analysis. I will initially present our position on density and then have Joy Corona and, uh, of Black Engineering, who's here this evening, address the drainage and Vince Mosca of Hay & Associates speak to the wetlands. KLOA is also here this evening to respond to questions relating to traffic. There are established and very specific design standards for how density is determined for property based on zoning ordinance. Section 46-27 of the ordinance was adopted to encourage preservation of open space and incentivize creative conservation development. Basically, one determines the total allowable density using the underlying zoning as, it's potentially, as it potentially could be in a conventional subdivision. This exercise does not consider cost or aesthetic. There are strict limitations on encroachment to wetlands and floodplain impacts, which we have met. After careful analysis of all these factors, we define how many lots can meet the technical definition of the ordinance. In this case, the total allowable density was determined to be 17 lots. This method of calculation was reviewed by our consultants and then sent to city staff for concurrence. We are advised the city engineer is also in agreement with our analysis. This method of determining density has been used on past developments, including the adjacent Oak Knoll, Abington Cams, and Conway Farms communities. We responded in writing to the LaSalle standards and are prepared to address each of them if requested to do so this evening. The plan uh, below reflects the result of this process. We are not requesting a variance or special consideration. We are simply following the city's method of determining a property owner's rightful measure of density. This was the result of significant review and scrutiny with input from city staff and Lake, uh, Lake County Stormwater Management Commission. Our revised plan has the following. Our density has been reduced to 16 lots from the allowable 17. The average lot area has been increased to 3,500 uh, 500 square feet from the previously proposed 21,500 square foot per lot. Conservation area will remain pre uh, preserved with strict covenants on use and maintenance. The nature trails have been modified to more internal and away from the south boundary. And I'm going to move on to drainage. With that, I'm going to introduce Joy. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Joy Corona. I'm the Water Resources Project Manager with Lake County Stormwater. I am a professional engineer and a certified floodplain manager with over 17 years experience in this field. I was the permit engineer for the Lake County Stormwater Management Commission for five years prior to my tenure at Fleck Engineering. I still consult and provide services to Lake County Stormwater since then. Um, I'd like to get a little overview on the existing drainage patterns. There's approximately 58 acres that flows onto the property from the south. The existing subdivisions to the south were developed prior to the current Lake County Watershed Development Ordinance. <coughs> Therefore, these subdivisions did not preserve wetlands, they did not preserve floodplain volumes, and they did not provide detention. The regional stormwater pattern so runoff from the property flows to the north onto the golf course. It then flows underneath the railroad and discharges to the middle fork. The base flood elevation is on all land upstream of the railroad tracks at a constant level pool of 667.7. So that's the land on the golf course, on the subject property, and extending onto the properties <coughs> to the south as a backwater <coughs> condition from the middle fork. The proposed drainage pattern, so the upstream runoff will remain tributary to the existing wetlands. The proposed pond is, will not impede flow from the Abington Cam Pond. There's an existing 15 inch pipe that's going to remain, that's the current outlet for the pond to the south of the property. There's an existing 24 inch pond or pipe that's located on the subject property that will be removed and a positive swale will be created and that's consistent with the request made by Christopher Burke Engineering on behalf of the adjacent property owners. <clears throat> I'd like to summarize some of the overall 
process with respect to drainage. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to coordinate with Burke Engineering during their review. Um, Thomas Burke and I have had a long-standing relationship and we've been reviewing each other's work for my entire um, tenure in this field. Um, I was able to address the comments that he and I had, or he had shared with me and incorporate those into our revised report that was submitted to the city in August. We provided some additional information to Burke Engineering, which they were able to take into consideration as part of their subsequent letter dated August 29th. A number of the concerns that were in the original review were resolved based on additional information that we submitted. The conclusions in the August 29 letter then would supersede those in the previous letter because we had provided additional information. We have addressed and incorporated all of the conclusions and recommendations in Burke's final letter in the proposed plan. Uh, several points to note. The detention pond was sized for zero release. This is a conservative methodology that results in approximately, um, the pond could be about 33% smaller if we didn't over detain to provide a watershed benefit. And this methodology was supported by both Burke and the city engineer. <clears throat> Directly from the Burke memorandum, um, the proposed revisions to the pond outlet, which were the ones I described on a previous slide, will eliminate the restrictions of the overflow caused by the ditch and downstream pipes being elevated above the pond outlet and overflow. So we've taken those into consideration and will provide this benefit that they've identified. The city engineer concluded that the information submitted provided sufficient detail to demonstrate that the proposed development would meet the regulations of the WDO. Furthermore, the city engineer noted that there's approximately six acre feet of floodplain storage in addition to detention. This is not part of the required compensatory storage. This is an above and beyond watershed benefit that's being provided by the design. There are some additional computations that will need to be provided during final engineering with respect to some swale sizes and storm sewer, but those are all final engineering design computations. And that process will ensure that the efforts requested by Burke and the city will be complied with and the project will be compliant. Turn it over to Vince Mosca with Hayan Associates so he can discuss the wetlands. You're welcome. Good evening. My name is Vincent Mosca. I'm one of the senior ecologists and vice presidents of Hayan Associates based out of Volo, Illinois. I've been doing wetland consulting in Lake County for over 25 years and even prior to the development of the stormwater management ordinance in the county. So the exhibit on the on the projector right now is the wetland delineation. We conducted a jurisdictional wetland delineation last fall. It was approved, it was the jurisdictional determination by the Army Corps and Lake County determined that all of the waters and wetlands on the property are considered isolated waters of Lake County, meaning that there's no federal jurisdiction and all jurisdiction remains with um, either the city or Lake County Stormwater Management Commission. The uh, total on site is uh, approximately 6.1 acres and the easternmost wetland, the largest wetland on the property was determined to be high quality. It was not mapped as high quality by on the county map, but during our field investigation, the uh, vegetative diversity was high enough to actually make it uh, to be considered a high quality aquatic resource uh, under county standards. Next slide, please. Is that me? Oh, it's you. sorry. So the total property is approximately 30 acres. The wetlands, again, are 6.1 acres of the total. Um, the proposed land plan is proposed to impact approximately 1.62 acres of wetland, uh, which most of that is considered uh, lower quality wetland. There's 0.22 acres of high quality wetland that is proposed to be uh, disturbed in the center of the property because of the orientation of the, the one finger of the wetland. It's um, unavoidable for impact, but um, over 96% of the high quality wetland is being preserved by the current plan. We're providing buffer in excess of what the, the requirement of the ordinance and we propose to do on-site wetland enhancement and buffer enhancement and naturalization of the detention pond all to get some mitigation credit and whatever mitigation credit we do not achieve on-site we would look to uh, off-site wetland mitigation bank in the Chicago River watershed. Thanks, 
<clears throat> In summary of, our, of, the, of the facts, we'll start with the drainage uh, and wetlands. Our site is downstream from all adjacent properties south of our property. All engineering has been designed to accommodate on-site and upstream off-site stormwater drainage. This has been reviewed and confirmed by both the city engineers and in theory through an independent review by Burke Engineering. There are 6.10 acres of existing wetlands and 1.71 acres of mitigated uh, wetlands off-site. The remaining 4.39 acres will be enhanced and restored. We have met with uh, Lake County Stormwater Management uh, Commission and they are supportive of our planning methods. And finally, the plan of floodplain volume is above and beyond the minimum WDO requirements. On density, our proposed plan offers 16 lots as opposed to the 17 allowed by ordinance. Conservation development is a proven method of planning and has been the preferred approach to responsible planning in this and now other communities for almost 20 years. Historical data confirms the homes in conservation planned neighborhoods have more value than those of more conventional subdivisions. Our independent study confirms this method of planning actually enhances property values around them. We have reviewed the LaSalle standards and are consistent with the historical precedent in the community on each of the requirements. As for traffic, there were specific questions that were raised and I wanted to address those, uh, each of those. Uh, the first one was timing of the first study. Our second traffic uh, analysis of Conway Oak Knoll Road intersection resulted in a negligible difference in average vehicle delay. Conway Road's ability to support additional traffic. Conway Road is a rural design and carries approximately 600 vehicles per day. Our proposed development is projected to increase that volume by 12 to 13 cars during peak hours, which is 2% more. Back up on Waukegan and Everett Roads. Our proposed development will continue a minimal amount of additional, uh, contribute a minimal amount of additional turning movements both Waukegan Wauke at Waukegan and Everett Roads. Safety hazard at Conway and Oak Knoll uh, Roads. The issues of motors rolling through intersections and or speeding is a local issue and no more or less than any other neighborhoods. Simple access to prop, uh, single access to property. There are several examples of residential developments in Lake Forest that are served by a single roadway for ingress and egress. Uh, other comments that were offered, nature trails too close. We heard the concerns of our neighbors and have moved the proposed nature trail to more, in a more internal location. Impact on wildlife. The enhancement of existing high quality wetlands and improvement of the open space areas will significantly benef be beneficial to wildlife than a conventional planned development. Impact on property values. All evidence shows that a well-planned conservation development actually is a positive effect on surrounding property values. Out of character with adjacent neighborhoods. We're utilizing an encouraged option in the ordinance that allows no more lots than existing adjacent properties and offers more natural buffer area between most of the existing homes affected. And that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chairman. I do have examples of, uh, of the kinds of homes that we're gonna do, but I don't think it's really that relevant tonight. And I have our consultants here to address any questions the board might have, or for that matter, the public might uh, have for them. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, identification of issues by city staff. Kathy? Thank you, Chairman Lay. <clears throat> um, just to review, uh, what you have before you is a request for a series of actions, um, and each of those actions are dependent um, upon the earlier action. There is a request before you for rezoning of the property from the current zoning of R5, single residence, uh, three acre minimum lot size, to R4, single residence, 60,000 square foot minimum lot size. Um, R5 has long been considered a holding zone by the city, particularly for properties that are um, located in established, uh, within established subdivisions. Um, there is some R5 zoning in the northwest quadrant of the city where properties are adjacent to forest preserve land um, and city services aren't readily available. That really is a, a, a different scenario than properties such as this one where the R5 zoning is a zoning district that's applied at the time properties are annexed if there is no development plan proposed at that time. 
Um, you do have examples of other uh, isolated properties or surrounded properties in the community that are zoned R5. Um, so the request for rezoning of this property is very appropriate. Uh, in fact, the comprehensive plan identifies this property as appropriate for acre and a half lots, which would be the R4 zoning district. The comp plan provides use designations. Uh, it does not, um, it, it is a guide. Uh, it doesn't apply a zoning district but the request for R4 zoning is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Um, you do have uh, in, your, in the staff report provided to you a review of the criteria for zone changes. Uh, criteria speak to compatibility, speak to uh, the character of the surrounding development, the type of surrounding uses. In this case, the R4 zoning is very appropriate for this site. The second request before you is the application of an overlay district. Uh, the overlay district allows for a planned preservation subdivision. Uh, this overlay district was developed, uh, was established and placed in the city code in the um, late 1980s. And it was really a reaction to the many conventional subdivisions that were occurring in the 80s and 90s. Subdivisions that really didn't, that, that simply took the minimum lot size, spread those lots over an entire parcel didn't look to preserving woodlands or wetlands or historic resources uh, or open space in general. Um, Lake Forest Open Lands Association was very instrumental in working with the city uh, to put in place provisions in the code that would allow conservation subdivisions. Uh, this property does uh, really fit the model of the types of properties that were intended to benefit from the flexibility offered by that overlay district. This property has some woodlands, uh, certainly has a lot of buckthorn, but it does have some significant trees, uh, has some wetlands, um, wildlife has been mentioned, certainly a, a, there would be a benefit to having some open space uh, in proximity to the golf course. Uh, so this property, as it's configured currently, uh, given its the unique features, really is appropriate for that overlay district. That overlay district does not allow a density transfer, and that's a question that was raised at the last meeting. A density transfer would mean uh, taking density from a portion of the property that is not otherwise developable and adding that density to other parts of the lot. Uh, to demonstrate that the density is right, the code does require that a conventional subdivision plan be developed. Um, and there was a conventional subdivision plan developed uh, and submitted to the city early in this process. City engineering staff reviewed it, asked a number of questions, asked for further information. That plan was revised, additional information was submitted, and a revised conventional subdivision plan came in and engineering staff does believe that it presents a reasonable layout of a conventional subdivision. That conventional subdivision does still preserve parts of the property as open space. It does, does still provide for on-site detention, but it, it concludes that 17 lots could be developed on this site based on the minimum lot size in the R4 district. Uh, that type of layout, um, wouldn't necessarily be uh, a, an attractive layout or one that the plan commission might want to support. There are some oddly configured lots. Uh, it doesn't uh, maximize the ability to preserve open space, but that 17 lot conventional subdivision does establish the allowed density for this property if it's developed as a planned preservation subdivision. The third item you have before you is a request for tentative subdivision plat approval. Normally subdivisions, especially if they are, are fairly large in size and they include uh, public improvements, go through a two-phase process. The tentative process really looks at the overall configuration, the density, uh, the preliminary engineering, and determines that the subdivision is workable and that generally that subdivision layout the density is supported by the city. With that information, with that approval, then the developer moves forward and does further detailed work on engineering, layout of the plan, detailed landscaping, detailed tree removal information. That work would occur between tentative approval and final approval. 
after tentative approval and after that work is done, the subdivision would need to come back to the Plan Commission and ultimately the City Council for final approval, similar to the subdivision you have uh, before you later tonight. Mm -hmm. um, the third, the, the fourth approval really is a, a, a piece of the approval that would come forward as part of the final approval. With any plan preservation subdivision, a special use permit is also required, not to grant variances, but to allow the Commission to establish very specific conditions of conditions of approval that may relate to landscaping, that may relate to uh, development of certain parcels, layout of nature trails, uh, preservation of certain trees. So that's a piece, a detailed piece that would come back to you as part of final approval. So those are the pieces before you tonight. Um, I would suggest that the, that the Plan Commission move through the first three in sequence because uh, Numbers two and three don't make sense if, if you haven't uh, recommended approval of number one. Um, just a few other comments. Uh, City Engineer Dan Strand is available this evening. He is in the audience available for questions. He spent a considerable amount of time reviewing all the materials that have come in over the last couple months on this subdivision uh, and does support the preliminary engineering plans. Uh, you did receive a revised traffic study from uh, the developer. We also, at the Plan Commission's request, asked the Police Department's records section to review accidents in this area. Uh, the Police Department found that, that the accident rate in this residential neighborhood uh, is, is really very low. Um, nothing caught their attention, nothing called this area out as particularly dangerous or particularly congested. Um, the addition of 16 lots, as proposed in the subdivision, is not uh, a number that will overtax residential streets. <clears throat> there are many residential streets in the community uh, that have considerable, considerably more traffic than what we see in streets in this area. Uh, you did receive comments about Conway Road. Conway Road is a rural type road, uh, similar to, again, many other roads in the community. Ridge Road and Telegraph come to mind. They are narrow roads, narrow lanes, and they're bordered by st steep drainage ditches. Uh, that really is a policy issue. Um, from time to time, there are discussions about should those roads be widened, uh, which would impact the adjacent properties? Should they be curbed, guttered, sidewalked? Um, that is really a, a broader policy discussion for the city, uh, and it's not an issue that will be resolved directly with this subdivision. Uh, just in conclusion, uh, the petitioner has submitted all the necessary detail. Uh, this is a strong subdivision uh, that, that does conform with the applicable criteria, does conform with uh, past <coughs> approvals, um, and does uh, uh, present a subdivision that, that really is consistent with the types of subdivisions that we often hear uh, the most compliments about. Subdivisions that offer something a little bit different, subdivisions that offer uh, lot sizes that perhaps are a little bit different than those immediately surrounding the property. Um, it's not unusual in plan preservation subdivisions to actually have a mix of lot sizes within a particular subdivision. Um, the community is developed. Uh, in large part uh, in a way that puts large lots in very close proximity to smaller lots. Um, even in the original plat of subdivision, you, for the, the city, you saw very large estate lots uh, very close to small lots. And that uh, pattern has really increased as estate lots have been subdivided, uh, adding more small lots to the east side of town. Um, so there's nothing in the subdivision that um, appears inconsistent. Staff is supportive of uh, the requested zone change, of the application of the overlay <laughs> district, and of uh, support of the tentative plat subject to the conditions presented in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, at this time, we'll move to <clears throat> questions of either uh, petitioner or staff. Uh, I'll start it off. Mr. Sw uh, Swanson, <clears throat> just have uh, three real quick questions. In your uh, revised site plan here, this. Yes, sir. In several of the lots, specifically number one, four, five, seven, eight, and nine, 
there are dotted lines. Uh, lot four, for example, a banana-shaped lot. I believe those corresponded to your wetland specialist. These, these are ex are these existing wetlands on the property today? The are you talking about on on the lots or? Well, on the. <clears throat> In the on the diagram, for example, here, Mr. Chairman, you, would this be an example of that? Uh, yes. That delineation. Yes. Yes. And there'd be another delineation up in here too. Yep. Yes, those are the wetlands. There are some lower quality wetlands in here. This is part of the uh, a finger of the higher quality wetland coming in off of. Uh, okay. Uh, coming in here. So yes, sir, it is. It is a reflection of that. All right. Second question is. Uh, <clears throat> the walking path, you made modifications to your initial proposal. Yes, sir. Is that walking path intended for the residents owning one of these 16 lots, or is it, in, is it also intended for use by the public living outside the subdivision? Actually, the answer is it's intended for the public, but the reality is that it's typically used by just those that live in the development or are in the neighborhood. Okay. For example, if, if I lived in Abington camps, I might walk my dog, but I would feel certainly free to walk through on that path. Uh, the same principle applied with Everett Farm when we did it. Uh, we thought we would get, uh, it would be primarily those who lived in the development, but we, we have had a mix of people throughout the community because it does interconnect with other trails. Oops, I don't know how that happened, but uh, it inter interconnects with trails throughout the um, okay. uh, community. In this case, Mr. Chairman, we, um, we uh, oh well, um, we, uh, in this case, we um, we don't have the luxury of being able. Thank you, Joy. We don't have the luxury of being able to connect to um, other trails. But in the event that that's possible, for example, if there was some way, and we're not anticipating this, but there was some way to have a tunnel or bridge over the tracks so that people can go back and forth to the uh, the football stadium and then onward to wherever, uh, we'd certainly be receptive to it. But it's it's really for that primary purposes. It also provides easy access for maintenance of the wetlands as well. Okay. Third question. Uh, we had a, rec a, rec and a communication dated September 8th from the Sunbergs. <clears throat> they requested consideration of rather than a 30-foot setback in lots number 14 and or excuse me, 15 and 16 to something more in the neighborhood of 50 feet. Without committing, would, but would you be willing to discuss that question with them, assuming that this would get approved for some, because I, I was out there today and I noticed that that home is really uptight, fairly close, I don't know where the property line is, Right. but is that something you'd be willing to consider during your whole process? Mr. Chairman, we've been open to any kind of discussion that's proactive. Okay. Uh, which lot was that again? It's uh, lots 14 and, four, excuse me, 15, 15 and 16. 15 and 16. It's yeah. the Paul and Lund Lauren Sunberg property. Right. Uh, these two right here. Is that correct? Right. This one and this one. And Sunberg is just south this right is the there. This Sunberg residence and this parcel. Right. Okay. And they're approximately, as I, I didn't scale it, but I, I think they would agree it's no less than 20 feet from their lot line. No less than 20. 20 feet, your house, I think you said your house is about 20 feet from the lot line right now? Yeah, okay. Which is the, is the normal setback, but yes, we're, we're open to discussion okay. about it. Mr. Thank Chair. you very much. Then last question is, without pictures or any access to, is the, your proposed subdivision, is it fairly heavily wooded now or not? Well, most of the woodlands, the answer is yes, but most of the, the mature woodlands are really through this corridor right in here. Okay. A lot of this down in here is buckthorn. Uh, there are some mature trees through here, but the site is certainly dominated by buckthorn. How would you say it compares to um, the lots along Abington? Wood, Abington. Abington. Uh, I don't know that I can answer that. I would think that a lot of the trees on an Abington cams, the mature trees, were probably affected by the development, but I, I, I didn't do a tree study for that area. Okay. So I, I would be unfair for me to comment. Okay. Thank you. Other questions of the petitioner? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, first one is to, well, Rick's up here already. Uh, Rick, 
it appears that with your proposed plan, your revised plan, you're, you're increasing, you've increased the lot area by about 70% from what you proposed before. You're, you're up at about 37, 500 for your- I, I would argue it's a little bit more, but yeah, but the, the average uh, earlier, Mr. Berg, was 21,500, and we've increased the average now to 37,500. So you're, you're at about 60% of the average size of the lots to the south. That would be about right, yes. Um, now, with that, you have an increase in size of a house that you can build, obviously. That's true. Yeah. Uh, what are your What are your assumed setbacks? Like, say, uh, your front yard and your side yard and your rear yard setbacks for these? Has that um, discussion been um, had yet? With uh, I want to, I could check it very easily, but I want to say we're 40 foot in the front, uh, 15 feet on the side yards, and 40 feet in the rear yard. I think we're a little more generous on our side yards than we than we would have to be. Okay. Uh, and Kathy, I have a question for staff, and I guess more nearly directed to the engineer. Uh, from what we've heard in this presentation tonight, some of which may be updated uh, within maybe a few days, I'm not sure the timing, is the city engineer feel um, fairly secure in the um, proposition that the stormwater is running north across this property and that and that during uh, times of, of peak rainfall and water retention that, that no water is really going to be backing up and heading south from the proposed site? Is that, is that the engineer's basic conviction at this point? I, I, I tend to believe that it is from what I've been reading and hearing, and I just want to sort of hear somebody tell me. Um, uh, Dan Strand with Gilwalt Hamilton. I'm the city engineer. Uh, generally, yeah, the, the stormwater flows south to north across the property. Um, but as was mentioned, there is a backwater floodplain associated with this area. So, is that part of that the Abington Pond that's referred to? No, that's that's the Middle Fork across okay, the, okay. the way. So All when right. that when that's in a floodplain condition, the water backs up into this property and and upstream properties as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead with uh, my original sort of inquiry as as to whether any of this water is going to work its way back to the Oak Knoll. Uh, um, in Abington Street houses, uh, not not the the stormwater runoff from this property, but more the again the backwater condition will still still exist. Uh, so when the Middle Fork floods, that it'll still reach that same elevation. Um, but again, this development will provide detention volume for the additional runoff from the houses from the roads, and it, on top of that, will provide an additional six acre feet of volume uh, in terms of compensatory <clears throat> storage. So. Uh, it actually provides a watershed benefit for um, the properties upstream of here as well as downstream as there's more volume for that backwater. Okay. Are you familiar with this uh, section at Ponds drawing that was submitted? I don't, yes, I don't have it up here with but you're me, familiar with it. I am. And does that look to be uh, correctly represented and delineated to you at the different levels? Yes, it does. So that would look to be a benefit to the people in the southern residences um, of Abington. Yes, there is a me there, there is more volume immediately downstream with the proposed development. That's all for now. John? I, I only had uh, one question. Then I drove by this, this evening or this afternoon um, to the property. And I think this is for Rick. Uh, um, it's a, as, I, as you look at it from the perimeter, obviously you're not, I'm, I'm not walking uh -huh. into it, but it's pretty densely um, I'll use the term wooded. Mm -hmm. So of the current um, tree and foliage that's sort of set around the perimeter here, especially as you get towards the, um, the southern and the western side, is that, what's your, what, else, what would be the plans for that? Is that to try to keep and, 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 uh, and restore some of the, the screening that's there? Or is it to start over, if you will, with, I mean, I mean, obviously retain and keep the larger trees, but explain to me what your thinking is around that, because it's hard, it's obviously hard to actually look inside there, given the, the density of that foliage right now. Right, I, I, I think the biggest problem with this site has been, it's, it's, there was an overabundance of buckthorn, and as okay. you know, it's very difficult to get through a site with that. We at one point wanted to go in and clear the buckthorn, the invasive species, and, and allow better access to the site. Um, I found in some cases there are uh, adjacent property owners that would prefer the buck form because it does provide a screen. Right. Our, our, our preference would be to remove it and plant uh, other more native species in there. 
And we would work with the city in that regard in terms of enhancing our landscape plan. We were actually prepared to present a landscape plan, but we felt it was a little too early because that's something that we typically work out with staff as this pro progresses. Having said that, uh, we left that idea open because there are some that might enjoy looking out into those wetlands and seeing that pond, and there are others might, that might not. Right. Um, and, and we'd be open to discussion, but I, I guess what I wouldn't want to do, Mr. Anderson, is have a spotty landscape plan where we're right. accommodating one person with pine trees and another person without. So uh, I feel confident by removing all of the buckthorn, or at least the buckthorn that we agree should be removed, we can revisit that and create a much better plan. I think you know that uh, clearing that buckthorn from the underbrush uh, of these uh, more mature oak trees is actually extremely beneficial to that. Uh, I understand that. I guess where I was going with this, and maybe it's more of a comment than a question, and that is with the kind of screening that potentially could be there, <laughs> the worry about the, that, there's a, that this is perhaps a diff, has a different character and feel to it, um, I would think would be somewhat mitigated by, by having more screening, perhaps separating from the properties around. Because these are large pieces of property. There's a lot of woods, as it is, and it's not a lot of visibility, certainly not in the summertime, around the property. So you wouldn't be looking right into that and saying, oh, it looks like we have 16 homes that are tightly con you know, t together versus the rest of the property. It just wouldn't, and I guess what's my question is, if there's additional screening that's, that's, that's going to be kept or, re or restored, <laughs> does that pr prevent at least some of the appearance or perception about the, the different character of, of that particular area that's being built on? I would argue that the, the, the green area you see between our proposed lots and the proposed wetland area, those are mature trees. Yeah. It's our intent to preserve those. So All that those. in itself, I believe, will provide uh, a very nice screen. It, it's, I'm not going to stand here today and tell you that you're not going to be able no, to no, see I homes. Understand. I, and I know you're not expecting that. But to, based on the, 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 the design scheme that we're proposing, we have the best opportunity to provide screening between neighbors, okay. adjacent properties. Other questions? Lloyd? <clears throat> Uh, I have a question for uh, the petitioner. Um, I'm curious, how, how do you increase lot sizes by 65, 70% uh, by eliminating just one lot versus the uh, initial iteration? That's a good question. Um, actually, what we did is instead of uh, we initially uh, felt it was it was the pre preference because we've done this in the past to have half acre lots. So naturally, we took the conservation areas and dedicated them uh, and ran the lots right up to them. What we did is by removing one lot and increased the size uh, average over the, the entire uh, development, but by also shifting into that open space area and and instead of having a dedicated. Uh, as an outlot, we incorporated it into the site and then did what we did in Everett Farm, which is to create conservation uh, boundaries that would have very strict guidelines for what can be done. For example, you could clear out buckthorn and, and plant native species, but you couldn't put a play set or put a shed or a pool or just clear it and put grass seed in there. And it's worked very well for us in Everett Farm. So that allowed us to increase the size. Mr. Berg, uh, in, in uh, initial comments from the May 14th meeting, uh, indicated that we were listening to, to, to board members and so forth, indicated we'd feel better if their lots were larger. And frankly, it, it, was, uh, it, it was immaterial to us. We would go in either direction. So we heard one of the biggest comments, or one of the comments that was made, was that the lots weren't consistent uh, with the neighborhood. So we felt this is a way to, to take that up a notch it was just a creative way to utilize the space that was already there. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, this proposal does increase the lot size and addresses that concern. Um, I think you indicated that the current uh, proposal, uh, 25 and a half acres roughly of the 30 are now developed acres. Is that correct? I think that was the slide. Four and a half acres restored wetland, 1.7 mitigated offsite. Might have been the first slide. There we go. 
Uh, there are a total of 6.10 acres. Um, the developed area, the, the impacted area that's reflected on this drawing, is 11.68 acres. So of the site, 11.68 would be uh, impacted and the rest would be enhanced or preserved. Okay, I misunderstood a pre another slide then. So you're, you're saying 11 and a half acres are of the, th of the 30 are developed? That's correct, would be, would be uh, uh, property. Okay, for, for uh, that proposed would, house. Would, those would comprise the lots? That's correct. Okay. We've got the buffers. Okay. Um, <clears throat> under your initial plan, how many acres were being developed? I'm sorry, I... I I'm, under, I'm, under the initial iteration of the plan, the first iteration of the plan, right. how many acres were being developed? Uh, I can't recall what it was, but there was a slight increase in the amount of impacted areas result of this. This were, it was a net sum result as far as the, um, the, the, the preservation area. So did we go from 10 acres developed to 11 and a half or something like no, that? I, I want to say it was, and I, I apologize, I don't have the old material with me, but it was. I mean, it's just intuitively. We increased to, the. To get the lot sizes up 70% from 21,005 to 375. Uh, and only eliminate one lot from the original 17, it just intuitively, uh, I conclude that you had to use more, more land, <laughs> more of the 30 acres to, de to develop that. I mean. I offered to help Rick. The, That's why I didn't hear you. <laughs> the green open space and a portion of the wetland buffer are actually on the properties. So that's where that difference is coming from. Uh, there is open space areas and wetland buffer areas within the properties. So rather than those areas being on an outlot, they're part of a piece of each individual property. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's clever. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, so maybe while you're there, I have my, my quick question if you're done, Lloyd. No, I wasn't quite, if, okay. I, if I may. Um, it actually, well, I can come back if you want to. Take well, as long as you're there. So what was the, what was the, uh, I think this is a question for you. What was the chosen process to meet the wetland mitigation requirements and most specifically where it was changed? So what, what path did you take to meet that's those requirements? That's actually Vince, but Thanks, that's okay. Vince. We're all very close to the mic. Vince is great. Yes, good evening. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by changed because the concept has always been sort of evolving. Sure. Well, how about what was the chosen process then? The, the stormwater management ordinance for the county, which is then under the, the city does not do the wetland review for isolated wetlands that goes to stormwater management commission. Right. There's a mitigation hierarchy in the ordinance that requires that you go, depending on how much mitigation acreage you need, you have to have a preference for either on-site or off-site mitigation credits. And so given the the lay of the land and the amount of stormwater detention that's needed and, and required buffer and the, the remaining open space, we can only get so much credit generated on site through enhancement of the existing wetland through invasive species management and those things. You can generate about 25% uh, credit for each acre for that. And so we, we decided to do that rather than doing formal mitigation on site of actually restoring land that it would actually become wetland in the future. We decided to do the enhancement on site and then the overflow, uh, the, the needed credit would go to the offsite bank. So take the so credit and pay less. By doing it on site, it's not free because there's, there's criteria that you have to meet and you have to do work and, and meet those criteria after a certain period of time. But then you would save your money's working for you on your own property as opposed to buying credits off site. So you get sort of the best of both worlds. Some of the formal mitigation goes to the bank, which is done the day you sign the check. But then the other enhancement then goes to make the property in a better shape for the future and then works to, to overall enhance the overall aesthetic and, and function of the property. Thanks, that's what I was looking for. Sorry to interrupt you. No, oh, that's fine. Um, my remaining question uh, has to do with my concern about uh, whether or not this is a uh, proper and legitimate use of the overlay district ordinance and, uh, uh, and the way we're rationalizing 16 lots uh, as developable on this, on this site. Um, so I guess I'm asking, what is the intent of the overlay 
district ordinance and how do we reconcile it with that pesky little clause in the ordinance which reads it is not the primary intent of this ordinance to allow density transfer and I'd, I'd like staff and the petitioner to address that if they if they would please Kathy you want to go first or the intent of the overlay district at the time it was created in the late 80s was to provide flexibility, was to provide an alternative to conventional subdivisions that would allow developers to still get the density that a lot was entitled to, but to encourage land uh, perhaps to be used more wisely, to preserve open space, to preserve woodlands, uh, in some cases to preserve an, an historic structure with appropriate land around it. Um, the idea or the requirement that to determine the density, a conventional land plan needed to be submit, needs to be submitted. Um, that was done in this case. And, and what that means is uh, the developer has to take the 30 acre parcel, uh, still find a way to meet applicable requirements uh, maybe not in an ideal way, but meet those requirements and lay out uh, lots that meet the minimum lot size. Um, and in this case, a plan was presented that showed 17 lots could be spread across this property. The entire 30 acres. Uh, still, the conventional plan, which is in your packet, does still preserve some portion of the property as open space. Um, the entire 30 acres would support uh, about 21 lots. Um, and development used to occur in that way before current regulations. Those that are our four to, lots you're talking about. Our four, right. correct. Right. Um, uh, before current regulations that deal with stormwater and deal with wetlands. So um, development of a 30 acre parcel with 16 lots certainly is not overbuilding this parcel. Um, certainly, if, if, if you look at the way other developments occurred, uh, both from a practical perspective, 16 lots on 30 acres really is a, a very reasonable density. It, it is a very um, uh, reasonable expectation for a 30 acre site. But the overlay district, plan preservation subdivisions, specifically those provisions were created to allow lots, to allow smaller lots to be created, moved on to uh, higher, drier portions of the property or property that perhaps was less encumbered by trees, um, maintaining the underlying density and allowing development to occur, but giving some flexibility to say, we want unique developments, we want unique neighborhoods, we want uh, distinctive subdivisions as opposed to subdivisions that are just laid out. It was directly a response to the type of subdivisions that were occurring in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Did you want to respond to that? I don't know that I could do better than that. <laughs> okay. So again, if I may, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I just, I would like to try and understand the process and maybe help us all understand it. Um, how many, uh, using the over, overlay district ordinance, how many lots could be developed using the R5 zoning. R5 is three. 30 divided by one and a half, or yeah. three. It's three acres. It's, it's Ten-ish. Ten, probably less, ten. more like nine, probably. Eight or nine, right? It, it's, I, I, it's, it's, it's nine. And that's right. subjective. It's nine point something, but let it, we round down to what the, right. the, it's nine. Okay, so w what I believe the plan commission is being asked to do is first, Take the ordinance, uh, uh, revise the zoning from R5 to R4 right. so we can get down to acre and a half lot sizes. Then apply the overlay district ordinance so that we can get 16 lots that can be reduced in size from that 60,000 square feet down to 37.5, basically, right? If you're using the same logic, it would be 17 lots, but in our case, we've got 16. Exactly. Okay, right. fine, fine. Right. And, and, and that's basically the process by which we're, which we're being asked to approve. Um, and again, I would just ask somebody to respond to how is that not a density transfer? 
Well, I would argue that it, we're, simp we're simply following what all other subdivisions around us have. We're asking for the same density, which we're allowed basically uh, by law. Okay. The R5 is a, uh, Kathy actually used the better term than I would, but it's more or less <laughs> a, a, a more restrictive uh, um, uh, zoning in the event that you really don't have any plan for that property. And in this case, it was an estate for many years. As you can imagine, many of the properties around there were states and there were larger tracts. And, and uh, I can't speak to whether all of them were transferred from an R5 to an R4, but I'm certain that they weren't all R4. So we're simply embracing the same zoning that's around us. And I would just add in response to your question, how is that not a density transfer? A 30-acre property uh, under the R4 zoning district, 60,000 square foot lots could be developed with, uh, I believe it works out to 21 lots. Um, if we were to say this property can be developed with 21 lots, we're going to make it smaller and we're going to take them off of the wetlands and we're going to provide enough land for detention, but we're going to allow 21 lots. That would be a density transfer because we know from the study done and the conventional plan developed that if you really take those 60,000 square foot lots and place them on the property and preserve area for the detention or, or whatever is needed, that in fact you cannot get 21 lots, you can only get 17. So in fact there is no density transfer from undevelopable portions of the lot. We're saying 17 lots in a subdivision that, that is not well laid out could be achieved we're using that as an underlying density without a density transfer and simply saying we're taking that by right density and placing them on only a portion of the property to provide the benefit of open space, tree preservation, wildlife habitat, and what general lines? character. Okay, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I have one last question for Dan Strand, engineering drainage question. <clears throat> Included in our packets were copies of uh, uh, Thomas Burke, of Christopher Burke Engineering, a letter to the uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Celsius and Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Serencion, I believe is a correct pronunciation. Do you agree or disagree with their analysis, conclusions, and recommendations? Well, I, <clears throat> I think two letters were mentioned today, and, and one of them, which I received, was dated August 7th. And I think that was based on the preliminary stormwater report. And so um, there, there have been a number of updates to that stormwater report. And so to the extent that they reference out of date information, I wouldn't agree. But generally, I agree, I agree with the findings of Burke that, um, you know, I, I think he concurred that there was a surplus uh, volume proposed within the floodplain. Um, and he, he, he did mention, as, as I mentioned in my letter, that <clears throat> There are some additional details to be worked out, but generally the, the overall scope of what's been presented uh, at preliminary engin engineering indicates that, that this development can meet the requirements. Okay, then lastly, uh, in the petitioner's statement of intent, I'm going to read what he says. He says, <clears throat> both our engineers, that's uh, petitioner's engineer, and the city's professional consultants have advised <clears throat> that our detention ponds, swales, and underground storm drainage structures are designed to and will perform according to current standards. Do you agree with that? I do. Okay. And then lastly, on the point of the Conway Farms undersized inlets would be increased in size. Would that facilitate movement of water away from uh, or, or <clears throat> from the um, the current uh, properties south of that main lot line and of course the petitioner's property as well I'm not sure what you're referring to okay well <clears throat> it says we have met with representatives of Conway Farms and they have agreed to allow replacement of the undersized inlets with those which are more suitably sized and that they're confirmed there is sufficient capacity within the existing sanitary systems to accommodate our proposed development as designed. Okay. You have no opinion on that? Not really. I, that, it okay. sounds like that's something between the developer and the neighbors. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
I have one other question, which maybe is obvious to a lot of people here, but what happens to the out lots over, this is my question for Rick, maybe the developer for the petitioner. It, what happens to the out lots, including the wetlands ultimately? We'll work through that, but the, the <clears throat> easy answer is that we would establish uh, uh, an HOA, a homeowners association, and part of that would be that there would be perpetual maintenance of those areas. And that's, so that is part of what, how you envision this being maintained and supported, sustained for the future. Okay. That's correct, yes. Okay. That becomes the covenants of the subdivision, Kathy? Correct. Okay, can I ask a next question then? Okay. Um, and this kind of piggybacks with my first question, and then I think Lloyd followed up with some interesting uh, inquiries about density. And Rick, you maybe want to pay attention to this, because with the increase in the lot size, and basically you borrowed from one, one um, aspect of the site to, to enlarge the lots and arrived at your new lot size. And, uh, and while there's, I think, benefit from the increase in the lot size just from just the figure ground with the properties to the south that it's more contiguous um, Kathy with other properties that have natural sort of easements and covenants to them like if you had a ravine and there's table non table land etc um, those are not allowed to enter into the bulk calculations in general correct uh, non table land um, is counted at a reduced square footage toward the bulk, conservation easements uh, aren't necessarily excluded from the bulk, bulk calculation. calculation. Okay, and with other subdivisions in particular, I think Middle Fork might be one. When that, was, when that, when that subdivision was created, they actually mandated a, a maximum square footage of their own and, and not to, they didn't use the actual city bulk calculation methodology, if I remember correctly, is that right? And was, was that done at the plan commission level when that was um, developed? I, I don't recall that was done for, for Middle Fork. It was done for Conway Farms. They had a more restrictive. Um, I think it was done for Middle Fork. Also. <coughs> I don't recall that off the top of my head. I would yeah, have to I think I do that. from some work there. So are those sorts of things plan commission um, concerns on something like this on a property this size? And, Certainly, if, if there were special requirements um, that you wanted to impose, that would actually come through the special use permit as we moved into the more detailed final approval. Because as we in increase the size of these lots, I think we've also, as I said before, we've been, you know, accordingly, the increase in the square footage occurs. It's defaulted that way. <clears throat> One thing that I don't want to see happen here is if we do take this forward, to have the result be a series of solutions that are addressing topographic uh, features, but then create something that looks so cramped and dense that we blew it when it comes to what's considered good environment for the final product. And, and one of the things I wanted to do on plan commission is sort of think ahead a little bit on those um, ideas so that we can kind of incorporate them and at least be aware of their impact on the final product. I don't know how we address that this evening or how far we'll get, but I think that might be worth throwing around, tossing around, because the density transfer, and I think Lloyd's questions were actually really astute, because I think it's, it's in the definition. You know, the one side of the property wasn't as closely cramped with the 17 lot, you know, original proposal, but you take that 17 or 16 now and shift it all to the left to the two thirds, why everybody gets cramped in closer, and that, gives you the impression of greater density as far as traversing these lanes and living in the houses. So while abstractly, numerically it isn't, we want to be careful not to create a little um, effect of it here. At least that's my concern at this point. Okay, <clears throat> we'll move now to public testimony. Um, at this time, I would like to swear in those who think that they might want to speak on this issue or plan to speak, either in support or opposition. If you would please, those who wish, are gonna to wish to do so, please uh, stand and, and I'll swear you in. Okay. <clears throat> do you uh, all solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Thank you. 
Okay, we don't have registration slips this evening, so I will, uh, whoever would like to step forward first, please do so and uh, identify yourself with your, by your name and address. <clears throat> and I would also suggest that uh, uh, you keep uh, <clears throat> within the, our procedures, and that is five minutes per speaker. Thank you. Um, I will do my best, obviously, to stay within the time. I appreciate the time. Um, Speak up, please. Absolutely. Um, my name is Kyle Smanzik. I live uh, at the corner of Abington Cams and Oak Knoll with my wife and uh, two children. I've, uh, I sent a letter to the Planning Commission on uh, September 3rd. Um, my hope is you've read it. It seems like you have. I appreciate uh, taking the time and the effort that you guys are putting forth. Um, uh, I would just reiterate that I've tried to work reasonably with the petitioner um, to come to a middle ground, um, and I think everything has been civil, and I appreciate the efforts that he's also trying to make. I think the goal is to have a development at the end of the day that fits the neighborhood, works economically for the developer as well as the city, because uh, I think it's important to add residents to the city of Lake Forest. Um, on that, I, I don't want to cover points that are uh, relevant, so I'm going to try to hit to the main ones rather than go over ones that you guys may have already considered so that you know where our feelings lie. Um, and actually, before I do that, one thing I would request is that Burke Engineering was someone that I engaged and shared the documents with the petitioner. And I'd request that any of the information from Burke, actually it comes from the memos. It's not from what's presented by um, the petitioner, um, only to make sure that the accuracy of the information is correct. Um, I'm not saying anything against what the petitioner presented. I just want to make sure that it's accurate. Um, on that point, um, the the main concern that we have right now is tied to the density. It's and specifically, it's tied to the character of the lots and the character of the neighborhood around uh, the development site. Um, this is from the GIS Lake County uh, Mapping Service, and the red box up here is the development site. This is Abington Gams uh, and the properties around it. And this is the Oak Knoll Street from Conway Farms going north. It's, it's hard to see this on, and I'm not sure how to use your machine, but at, at the end of the day, um, if you, under my oath of testimony, the uh, numbers that are on there um, essentially are the smallest lot in the existing uh, larger neighborhood so maybe it's better if I go like this. I'm sorry to be confusing. In this larger neighborhood, if you look at this circle that I've drawn around the map, which I think is referred to by Kathy in our first city staff report as a larger neighborhood, the average size is uh, 1.5 acres. The smallest lot in that area is 1.2 acres, and it's on Leland Court down here. Um, Oak Knoll, um, when you're traveling up no Oak Knoll, north of Conway here, the smallest lot is 1.4 acres. When you're on Abington Cams along here, the smallest lot is 1.5 acres. The largest lot on Abington Cams here is 2.2 acres. My point is that when you look at it, Kathy's pointed out that the average size is 1.5, and then all of these properties that are immediately adjacent, the average is 1.7 acres. So it's a large average. When you look at the proposed development, the smallest lot is 0.55 acres. The largest two lots are 1.5 and 1.29. The average of all of those lots is 0.86 acres compared to 1.5 per Kathy's report and 1.7 to the larger. And the average of 14 of the 16 lots proposed is uh, three quarters of an acre. It's 0.78 acres. So to us, that is, a, is not within the character of the existing neighborhood. It, and when you drive down the street, of the neighborhood, which you see here, all the dark area, it's hard to see, but that's all wooded area, okay? And to give you an example, this is Stablewood Lane, and these are the houses on Stablewood Lane, which per the city staff report, this development is a proposal of the continuation of Oak Knoll, not Stablewood. Stablewood doesn't have the same wooded area around the properties. 
it's a different character of a neighborhood in our opinion. When you look at these going all the way down in the wooded area that go up to them, it's not going to be consistent as it's proposed with what's there in, uh, that's there now. And that's a major concern to us. Um, the second point that I want to touch on is the calculation to get to 16. I think you guys have um, looked at the questions that I was listening to. Um, you're looking at some of the similar stuff that I'm concerned with, which is uh, how that number came to be. Um, I asked Burke Engineering to put together what they consider the net buildable area, and I included this in my letter. Um, when I look at the ordinances and the codes um, and the overlay, as well as the, what I understand from my wetland expert um, is required for wetland buffers and uh, wetland protection, they put together a net buildable area that is this section. It's this dark striped section, does not include the orange to the right. And I'll be quick to finish up, I hear the, the beep. Essentially, that's 12.7 acres. And so when I look at laying across this under a conventional plan that they're gonna build o over this entire area, 21, which then gets to 17, the understanding that I get from two real estate attorneys at Levenfeld Pearlstein, a real estate attorney at Hunt and Williams, an environmental attorney from Hunt and Williams, a local zoning attorney from Ash, Anos, Freeman, and Logan, a wetland expert from Burke, and a civil engineer all combined, uh, which I've run this opinion by, it would be very challenging to build across that entire area of the lots that are being proposed under the conventional plan. I appreciate the time. Sorry to go over. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next person to testify. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Lauren Sunberg. I live at 530 Oak Knoll. <laughs> Sorry, hang on just a second. Let me get unpacked here. Uh, with my husband of 17 years, Paul Sundberg, and my two small children who attend Everett School, here is our house. You can see it right next to the proposed development. I was a eminent domain and commercial and uh, land use attorney for about 10 years before I decided to stay home and raise my children. And I accept the fact that this property will be developed. I respect the petitioner's property interests, especially as an attorney. I understand he, he can develop the property, but I have to object to the plan as proposed for a number of reasons. Um, first of all, I also wanna thank you for driving through the area and looking at the subdivisions that surround the subject property. Um, I appreciate you doing that and seeing how close our house is to some of the lots there. I hope you had a chance to read my letter that I submitted. Um, first, I would like to just say that we object to the requested change from an R5 to an R4 because we believe that petitioner as he's indicated, he has no intention of developing uh, one and a half acre lots. He intentions, <coughs> intents, he, his intentions are to develop much smaller lots. Uh, so in our mind, the purpose of the change from an R5 to an R4 is, is nothing but to maximize density for him, or the petitioner, I should say. <coughs> and if you read section 46-23 of the zoning code, it says the plan commission shall not recommend the adoption of a proposed amendment unless it finds that the adoption of such amendment is in the public interest and is not solely for the interest of the petitioner. So for that reason, we request that the R5 change to R4 should be denied. Our principal objection is the overlay district that he seeks. And as, as we have mentioned before and and has been discussed tonight, the, the issue is what is buildable under the ordinance. Section, I'm trying to get my exhibit, sorry. I'm not used to an overhead projector. Okay, here we go. 
Uh, I just want to read this provision again, and I'm sorry it's not a little bit more legible for you, but everybody seems to stop about after buildable in this paragraph. And so I just want to read it again with everyone. It, it says, 46-27, paragraph 3 says, it is also the purpose of this section, this is the overlay district, to protect those areas or portions of property identified on the historical residential and open space preservation map as significant parts of the landscape heritage of Lake Forest, such as wetlands, floodplains, poor soils, woodlands, meadows, prairies, savannas, environmentally sensitive, and or significant open space then what everybody needs to focus on is the last paragraph, or the last sentence of that paragraph. It is not the primary intent of this ordinance to allow density transfers, thus preserving large areas of open space for properties that would not otherwise be buildable, <clears throat> such as those areas listed above in this paragraph. Again, wetlands, floodplains, flood poor soils, wetland, woodlands, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It doesn't say non or non mitigated wetlands. There's another definition of buildable area in section 38-2 of the zoning code. It says it's an A 32-2A. The definition section. It says buildable area is the gross land area of a lot less all required setback areas and all floodplain. The minimum buildable area is also set forth in the design standards in section 38 dash 51, which I don't seem to have right here, but I can read it to you. It says, lot design. The following standards shall be considered in reviewing all site and building plans. Lot design. All lots shall be designed so as to contain buildable area of not less than 70% of that obtained on a rectangular lot in the same zoning classification, which here is R4, which has both minimum width and minimum gross land area tabulated as follows. Zoning classification for a minimum buildable area in an R4 is 23,000 square feet. Could you uh, wrap up your presentation, please? Yes, I have a couple more points I'd like to make. Given the extent of the documents that the petitioner has submitted, I would ask a little bit of leeway. I have one more point I would like to make after this one, and that's it. Okay, well, it's hard to read, but what, I, what occurred to me actually this morning was that we have this R4 density modeling plan submitted by the petitioner that he's revised from his original plan. If you recall, the original conventional subdivision plan just had a T subdivision with the lots just spread out as if the floodplains and the wetlands didn't even exist. And that was supposed to entitle him to his 17 lot density. Then he revised the plan. And now, after our last hearing, he, he has submitted a plan with an allowable lot density matrix now, he's, he has the lots listed by number. He has the gross square footage. He has the wetland square footage. And then he has the floodplain square footage. What he doesn't allocate is the 100 foot requisite buffer for the high quality wetland. So what I'm saying to you is my reading of the ordinance I'm no expert, I'm a stay-at-home mom, but it seems like 
it should include this setback of the 100 foot buffer in determining whether or not he has the 23,000 square foot buildable area requirement met. The other thing I'd like you to notice is that at the bottom, he says, note that wetland and floodplain gross areas provided above overlap. So how are you supposed to figure out what you're supposed to subtract from the gross lot area if you don't know at what point the wetland and the floodplain overlap to get to the 23,000 square feet? So I just think before the commission can make a determination about whether or not this is a reasonable plan, and I think just by looking at it, you might as be able to determine that, but if we're gonna get into the dirty details, then I think that might be a question to be answered. Finally, we have repeatedly asked why this subdivision isn't being accessed to Stablewood. And the answer we've gotten is that it can't be accessed. Stablewood's a private road, there's no authority of the city, <coughs> they, they, can't, and, you know, they can't access it without approval of the homeowners association. So, Paul, will you hand out what I copied? So I FOIA'd the homeowners, I ain't got it. I FOIA'd the homeowners, um, I mean, um, the, the Conway Farms Phase 1C uh, file of the city, and I reviewed the documents in the file. And there was more than just discussion about access to Stablewood Lane. It was actually a condition that the city imposed prior to the approval of the Plata subdivision and prior to allowing Conway Farms to have a private road. <clears throat> so I, I copied in, in, some in of the documents. In one or two sentences, what does this say? This says that as a condition to approval, the Lockett property was required to have on its plat access to Here it is, right here. I don't know if you can read it, but all you have to do, here, I actually have a copy. May I approach? Just please answer the question. What does it say? I would like to show you, and that would be answered. Ma'am, you've already gone over about double your time. Am I not making points? Can you not give me two more minutes? No. Please? Yeah. Watch, let her talk. Please wrap up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please wrap it up. We can, we can see it there. We can see it. What are the rules, President? <clears throat> the rules are. Five minutes. Five minutes, and we've already gone seven or eight. Really? Will yes. anybody give me their five minutes? I can go by five minutes? Thank you. Okay, so may I have five more? No, you've got three of three. Okay. You've got three so of her five. So on the plat in large writing, if you look, it says future easement for ingress and egress and public utilities in conjunction with the development of property to the east, right on Stablewood Lane, right where the Asphalt property comes out and accesses Stablewood. Also in the file is a history of the city's policy to interconnect streets because of the safety issues involved. The, there were memos back and forth from the fire department, from the police department, from Mr. Crook, who was the, the then director of planning and development, talking about how important it is to have Stablewood and Oak Knoll interconnect. Okay, I hear you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. My name is John Celsius. I live at 1340 Abington Cams Drive, which is on the south portion and east portion of the subject property. <clears throat> I think in your questions you refer to our pond. Uh, we've owned the property since 1999, so it's about 15 years that we are in residence here. My wife voiced her concerns 
about this development uh, on May 14th, as you recall. Unfortunately, my wife cannot be here today because of a medical procedure going on. So here I am. My first issue here, I'd like to address the logic of the city staff report. Actually, it's dated today. So the logic of the city staff report, to me, it sounds like, number one, R4 zoning is a given. Number two, theoretically, 21 lots fit into a 30-acre R4 zoning. Three, and I quote from the staff report, quote, the overall density of the proposed development will be less than the overall density of the surrounding subdivision because portions of the site will be preserved as open space. I got this this morning. But the open space is not buildable, as we heard. <clears throat> Hence, to me, density ends up being a mathematical concept not a reflection of reality. Is this circular reasoning? Possibly. And the report also disregards a lot of other inputs from the residents included in our letters. Now, if you take a look at a big picture of this development at these small lots, I personally feel, my opinion is, if you look from a satellite, this subdivision of 16 lots will look like a trailer park compared to the surroundings, <clears throat> my opinion. Okay, beyond what I've just stated, the pond between our property and the easterly neighbors, the Serencioni's, empties via a culvert into the high quality wetland number one, as you saw. Our concern is the destruction of the wetlands as proposed by the developer. As just explained by Kyle Zemancic, the high quality wetland needs to be preserved and buffered by at least 100 feet. Also, filling in the outline, wet, uh, the other wetlands, although they're lesser quality, will put additional stress on the high quality wetland which receives all the stormwater. Now, your decision will balance the profit of third-party investors versus the quality of life for the Lake Forest residents who bordered the proposed development. And let me be clear, we are not against the development. We feel strongly that eight and maybe even up to 10 residences will, number one, will preserve more of the wetlands, will fit the character of the neighborhood, will provide a reasonable rate of return for outside investors, will provide the city of Lake Forest significant additional tax revenues, and will maintain the existing quality of life for the Lake Forest residents to the south of this proposed development. Your decision, if not the best, could carry significant consequences and liabilities. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next person to testify, please. Uh, my name is Ali Aguihat. Um, I live at 922 Oak Knoll. I think I was probably the last one in this neighborhood that developed a property. Um, I, we completed our project in 2013. Um, <clears throat> It was a pretty treacherous experience working with the city. Um, even though we met all the guidelines, uh, they wanted us to subordinate a roof line to make the house look more fitting to the neighborhood. And um, there was times where I was upset with the process, but I took a step back and I said, you know, this isn't, even though this plot of land is mine, it's the neighborhood is ours. And I think the point that I'm trying to make here is you have to listen to the voice of the people. Um, whether it's an NFL team, you know, no one, somebody just can't go buy an NFL team, it has to be approved. You know, if you're looking and thinking about 
the World Trade Center, you know, how they developed it after the big tragedy, you know, it takes the voice of the people to agree on what they're going to develop. And in the same way that we developed our project, you know, we took the considerations of the city. I mean, all the way down to the brick color, the roof line, um, setbacks, etc. And we, we spent a lot of time and energy complying to the city. And in hindsight, um, you know, I'm happy with what I have. And I think the city did the right thing by enforcing their criteria. Um, and I think in, in this development that is being proposed, I'm not an expert on the zoning and all the things that R4, R5, I don't even know what it is. I don't care. Um, but clearly, you have citizens that are unhappy and do not want this proposal. Um, and, and the point I'm trying to make is you have to listen to the people. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good evening. My name's Peggy Talbot. I live with my husband, Charlie, and our four boys at 611 Oak Knoll. We're the third house on the east side of the street as you come into the neighborhood from Conway. Um, we've lived, lived there about seven years after relocating from Louisville, Kentucky. I'll make this brief. I think both Kyle and Lauren submitted to you lengthy documents that really went through a lot of the um, questions that are coming to light tonight. And I think while they didn't have as much time to verbally go through those, I know that there was an in-depth um, document that was provided to you. Our family has many of the same concerns voiced by um, the citizens that have spoken so far and those that may follow, um, certainly with regard to density, the inconsistency of the development with the character of the existing neighborhood, the drainage, stormwater management, and preservation of wetlands, and then the overall consideration of the impact to the infrastructure and integrity of the surrounding area. I don't need to spend a lot more time. I think what I do want to say is that the questions that have surfaced and have been proposed in those documents relating to the density transfer that is occurring, no matter how you look at it, we are shifting the density of a 30-acre parcel into a much smaller space is one in question and therefore presents a challenge to you tonight as to whether or not you can move forward with tentative approval. I don't think that the requirements have been satisfied with those questions still on the table. Secondly, I think with regard to the inconsistency of the surrounding neighborhood, I think it's awesome that you've all had a chance to, to travel into the neighborhood. I think Kyle's overview with the overhead shot, you could see the woodland areas, um, gives you a real sense of the difference that would occur as you transfer into this new neighborhood. I know the petitioner had provided some earlier documentation and in the May meeting made a reference to that it might draw its character from Conway Farm. I think if you ask Mayor Schoenheider or any of his neighbors who live in Conway Farm, they wouldn't say that they draw their character from Oak Knoll or Evington Camps. I, I, I just don't think that argument stands. So the, the integrity and the one point I think everyone has agreed on is that whether it's the neighborhood, the city, or the petitioner, is that the intention of this property from the start was an extension of Oak Knoll. I think the petitioner made a great point saying, you know, that's why it was never a full rounded cul-de-sac. It was intended to be an extension of Oak Knoll in the area around it, which therefore gives such logical support to the fact that it should continue that character. I think um, the issues of, of drainage, wetlands mitigation, and stormwater, again, well covered. The only thing I would say is we all know the moment you dig a shovel in that area, things are going to change. It's an interconnected wetland basin, much broader even than the Abington Cam's Conway impact area. So once you touch it, it will change. Perhaps one of the most concerning things as a citizen, looking at this when we read the staff report with, that was released, was the comment that um, going forward, the homeowners association of the new development would be responsible for all ongoing maintenance of the infrastructure for all aspects of the stormwater sewer system, preserve wetlands, and open spaces. Now, gosh, I'm not an expert, but that sure sounds like 
I kind of don't trust what might happen, so down the road, you guys better take care of it. So again, just as a citizen in the area, I might say, wow, you know, this seems like we have some serious issues, again, that still need to be considered, thereby delaying the need for a tentative approval this, if, this evening. My last quick point would be on the impact to the integrity and infrastructure of the surrounding community. Um, we moved here with four um, relatively young children, six to 12. We look like the kind of family who might find the homes in this new development exactly appealing if we were relocating here a year or two from now as this development moves forward. I will say, now that those younger children are a little older, um, I'd have to call into question the traffic study that was done informally because the in and outs out of my house alone on a daily basis are 15 to 20. I, we have six in our family. I've got three teenage drivers. We make lots of trips in and out. So as families move into this development, the impact of the traffic study that was provided in the potential 12 to 13 additional trips down Conway, if we're a whole lot more Talbot families, 16 Talbot families move in that area, you're gonna have a few more cars on the road than you've projected. And I think that brings to the point that was brought up earlier, which is you wanna be thoughtful about not just what does this look like now, but what will it look like when it's full of robust, vibrant families and all of the activities and, and things that come with it. So being thoughtful about that. To summarize, I'd quickly say my call to action would be one, to delay your tentative approval until you, until you feel confident that all the questions have been resolved as have been laid out on the table. Two, that I recognize if the market does not support the larger lot size, again, as has great information been provided, why not consider the smaller lot size with open space integrated between the lots? I think that the uh, petitioner earlier indicated the 15-foot easement between the houses. It might logical be logical to integrate some of that woodland space between the homes. Certainly, it would support a lower density then with that requirement, but it would keep the integrity of the neighborhood. Um, we obviously ask you to address the critical issues related to the wetlands and ask you to be prepared to address the issues in the surrounding area, the issues on Conway Road, its narrow um, convergences. I think the accident report doesn't include all the slide offs that really never involve, you know, a police incident report. But, you know, th when the plows come down Conway Road, they plow wider than the road. So I always tell my kids when they're driving, you have to drive in the center on Conway because it looks like there's road over there when the snow is smooth, but it's not. You slide off and then your car is resting on its axle, axle and it has to be lifted out. So again, those are just my brief comments with a quick call to action. Thank you so much for your consideration. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, thank you, Chairman. Uh, my name is Helene Sudak, and I do not have an extended background like many of the professionals in this room, but uh, I'm just a senior at Lake Forest High School, but I live at 1420 Abington Camps. I would just like to start out by stating a fact that many people will know if they research wetlands, and that is that wetlands are vital and crucial to animal life that depend on them, <coughs> as well as being a wonderful resource for human life. They are complex ecosystems with a dazzling array of beneficial functions that make them extremely valuable. Their benefits include water purification, flood protection, shoreline stabilization, groundwater recharge, and stream flow maintenance. The same functions they have for protecting water quality for humans are also critical for other wildlife and fish that live in the waters of wetlands. Many endangered or threatened species require wetlands during a part of their life cycles, and even migratory birds depend on wetlands. They are an important flyway on the Middle Fork River and on Lake Michigan and these birds need a place to stop. They have a set migration highway, and if you take away this wetland, they won't know where to go. They will keep coming back for water in this area. Wetlands, wetland plants and small animals, especially insects, are essential links at the lowest of the food chain. A wetlands environment supports these plants and animals, which in turn support the larger animals that feed on them. While an otter or a trout may seem may be a more attractive species to protect than some anonymous insect or plant, the latter are no less in the overall scheme. If we diminish the lowest levels of the food chain, the higher levels will suffer as well. I personally find the concept to remake a wetland somewhere else, regardless if you replace one or 100 acres to redeem yourself, absurd. You will, you will stop... <laughs> 
you will still be affecting this extremely specialized area. This wetland has been developed over hundreds of years, and as I was out there today, I could hear several species of birds and insects that call this ecosystem their home. And speaking on the point of remaking wetlands, there are several issues that have been found. First of all, I do not see in the new plan a brand new detention pan detention pond created. I see an existed one that is filled, but with all of the homes being made, they will need to create a new detention pond. Secondly, mitigation is proposed to be on site, requiring the loss of additional woodlands. Clearly on the plan, it is covered with trees. And in the Lake Forest Ordinance, it states that if you take away a tree, you must plant it again otherwise. Thirdly, the buffer zone cannot be intruded around wetlands if it is found for financial reasons. I'm not quite sure how this building could be found could be found to not be related to financial reasons. Fourth, we have not seen evidence that the building committee is buying credits for wetlands to remake. There are not credits currently available to purchase in Lake County, meaning they will have to buy credits outside of Lake County, making the cost vastly more expensive. If they do not choose to build the wetlands, but instead take the route of paying the proposed fee that is set, they will pay money to the Stormwater Management Commission for something these wetlands do for free. They are flood protection. I cannot stress enough that this benefit is free. This ecosystem is not asking for compensation. It is not asking for anything in return. If this building is allowed to happen over the wetlands and flooding occurs in my neighbor's homes or mine, you will then be passing on financial liability to taxpayers or insurance payers when I believe it should lie with the developer. This causes a negative externality. If you take a look at flood increases due to climate change, it has gone up severely and this trend is predicted to continue. I have a quote from the White House Office of the Press Secretary for immediate release on May 6, 2014 and is a fact sheet for what climate change means for Illinois and the Midwest. Extreme rainfall events and flooding have increased during the last century, and these trends are expected to continue, causing erosion, decli declining water quality, and negative impacts on transportation, agriculture, human health, and infrastructure. If the planning goes through, I repeat, you will be taking away one of the best free replacements for flooding. Lastly, I want to touch upon the problem of water. The wetlands, if built upon, will become houses, and those houses will have lawns. Those lawns will need extra water to be irrigated. But already in this town alone, we use 14 million gallons of clean drinking water per day in the summer to irrigate our lawns and fill our pools, compared to the 2 million gallons in the winter for houses. Creating more lawns will require more water while destroying the place to put the excess, say, from the rainfall. This is one of the ways this building Oh, we have already had to buy water from surrounding communities to water our lawns. This is one of the ways this building is not isolated to immediate residents. This wetland, being on the west side of Green Bay Road, drains into the north branch of the Chicago River that flows into the Des Plaines River, then the Illinois, then the Mississippi River, to help clean pollutants. This destruction will cause ripple effects, and these effects are not limited to these homes proposed for destruction. I'm almost finished. I'd like to end by announcing the winners and losers of this building process on the wetlands, if it follows through. The financial resources for developers win. The wildlife loses. The surrounding neighbors directly connected lose, and the taxpayers of Lake Forest lose. I pose the question, following. Will taxpayers' money outweigh the cost needed to replace what is destroyed? Thank you. Next person to testify, please. I would ask, too, that if what you have to say has already been said, uh, say you agree with that statement and uh, so that we move it along. Uh, <coughs> good evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I believe, my name is Peter Fry, I live at 1375 Edmonton Cams. My wife and I bought in back in 1998. And I've been in the investment field for over 40 years and I find the idea that this new, new subdivision is gonna be additive to my property value to be laughable. Um, we have roughly about 1.7 acres, 1.8 acres in, in, our, in, our, in our property. And just getting back to Mr. Semanzik's comments, 0.875 certainly would lower, but in, our, in my opinion, would lower the property value that, of our property. I also noticed that I always feel like I'm fighting the city here as well, 
Because the winners, if you approve and take this zoning down from R5 to R4, the winners of this certainly would be the petitioner, because you'll be able to build more lots, but also would be the, the county of Lake County, because there'd be more property taxes. Also would be the city of Lake Forest, because there'd be more, more, more rooftops, more people in the community, more sales taxes. So I feel like uh, it just in, in reading Kathy's, uh, who was the director of community development, and her comments, I feel like I'm fighting the city as well as trying to fight the petitioner because it seems the winners, if you approve this, will be the petitioner in Lake County and in the city of, city of Lake Forest. And the losers will be the immediate neighborhood. Thank you for my comments. I mean, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul Sundberg. I live at 530 Oak Knoll, um, and I'm, I'll be very brief. Uh, I'm not a real estate attorney, but I'm an attorney, and uh, I don't know a lot about this process, to be honest with you. We've been learning as we've gone along the way. Um, and to summarize, I support the statements made by Kyle, the statements made by my wife, and the statements made by the neighbors. Uh, to me, uh, again, not being an expert, um, speaking from my gut and uh, after careful consideration, what a, a very careful consideration of the facts that I know, this, it, it, this is, it's obvious to me that this is a manipulation of the zoning ordinance in order to allow a density transfer. The proposed plan is totally inconsistent with the neighborhood. The small slot, I'll rely on Kyle, but I believe the small slot is my lot, right next to the parcel, 1.52 acres. Yet, the petitioner comes in and says, hey, let's take a 30-acre parcel and let's stack a bunch of lots in the dry part because I can't build in the wet part. When you look at the floodplain, you look at the wetlands, you look at the buffers, that were addressed in Kyle's presentation and in Lauren's presentation. There isn't 30 acres to build on. It's not even close. And it doesn't support 16 lots. It doesn't support to support 21 lots. The petitioner is trying to stack more lots than is provided for under the ordinance because it's financially beneficial to do so. And I would ask you to please carefully consider the advice that you're getting from the city. The ordinance says what it says. It was read to you. You are very bright people. You're on the plan commission for a reason. You know what you're doing. You have the ability to assess credibility, and we ask you to do so. The ordinance says what it says, and we assert it does not say what the city says. It says, it does not support, it does not support the lot, number of lots that the petitioner is asking for. That is the fundamental issue here for me, for my family. And I moved here a year ago. I bought on Oak Knoll. I was born and raised in Lake Bluff and Lake Forest. And I'm disappointed that I feel like I'm swimming upstream with no help from the city. This is not what I asked for. I don't even want to be here. I'm not challenging you. But I'm very disappointed that I've gotten no support from the city. In fact, I've gotten resistance. My family's gotten resistance. And as a Lake Forest resident, long time, my, par my parents, 40 years, I'm going to let my last statement is I'm disappointed. Finally, as far as Stablewood access, I ask you to take some time and think about what was said here tonight. There is documented proof that Stablewood is an access to Oak Knoll. Look at the documentation. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Mark Remus. I live at 1594 Conway Road, which is right at the intersection of Conway and Stablewood, right at the end of Conway Road. I have three points I wanna hit that I don't believe have been addressed this evening yet. Uh, number one is the traffic. 
on Conway Road. We've heard a discussion about automobile traffic. The studies have focused on automobile, automobile traffic. But as I pointed out at the last meeting and a number of other residents pointed out, an even greater concern is the pedestrian traffic on Conway Road. That traffic is substantial. There are some comparisons made in the traffic study, and I believe in, in Ms. Zerniak's comments, to uh, Ridge Road and Telegraph Road to Conway Road. Those are not analogous situations. Ridge and Telegraph at the relevant sections don't lead directly to the West Lake Forest train station and two rather substantial retail areas. That increases the pedestrian traffic tremendously. Obviously, as we increase the number of homes in this development, we increase the number of cars, we also increase the risk for pedestrians on that road. Uh, number two, uh, we've heard some comments about how these homes are inconsistent with the prevailing zoning in the area. I think it's also important to keep in mind that it's inconsistent with the uh, city's comprehensive plan. And Ms. Zerniak alluded to the comprehensive plan when providing her recommendation of going from R5 to R4, but there hasn't been any consideration of that in going from R4 to what are effectively three quarters of an acre lots. The city's comprehensive plan, and this is on page 29 of that plan, specifically states, the plan recommends that most of the new growth areas, and this property we're talking about tonight is one of the specific new growth areas listed, should be developed with a state residential land use with a maximum density of one dwelling unit per 1.5 acres. Continuing, and this is on page 30, if rezoning does occur, it will result in a development somewhere between R5 and R4. So the city's comprehensive plan never contemplates going below one house per 1.5 acres. In fact, it contemplates somewhere between three acres and 1.5 acres. So this development is not only inconsistent with the surrounding area, it's also inconsistent with the city's comprehensive plan. The third point I wanna make, and I wanna be careful here so it's not misunderstood, but I think it's a point that has to be made. Mr. Swanson has a lot of experience in this community. He's very well respected, and I've never heard someone say a bad word about him or his developments. He's also very well connected. I don't know if there's anybody who's appeared before this board more often than Mr. Swanson. Mr. Swanson has also hired Mr. Charles Crook, the former director of community development for Lake Forest. It's my understanding, at least according to Mr. Swanson's website, that he was in that role for over 25 years. I believe he may have been hired and worked with Ms. Zerniak. Now, if this group of insiders is able to come in to this commission and successfully get such a radical zoning change of going from R5 to R4 to three quarters of an acre in the face of so much public disagreement and dissent, it doesn't sit well with me. I think it certainly raises the appearance of impropriety, and I hope it doesn't sit well with this commission either. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Lay and members of the Plan Commission. My name is Mark Pasquese. I live at 1073 Old Colony, and I'm the managing broker of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services here in Lake Forest. I am strongly in favor of the proposed Oak Knoll Woodland subdivision. I think it's a great plan. The request for change in zoning from R5 to R4 is long overdue, and the plan preservation historic open space overlay district is being applied precisely as it was intended to be. That being said, I'd like to simply offer some opinion from the real estate side of things. The concern here tonight seems to be that more homes on smaller lot sizes would be detrimental to the neighborhood. In my opinion, that is completely unfounded and the opposite is actually true. The 16 lot plan with smaller lot sizes will only enhance the value of the surrounding neighborhood. This product is sorely missing from our current real estate inventory. It is desperately needed in our marketplace 
and it will be in extremely high demand. This development, as it is currently proposed, will directly benefit every homeowner in the surrounding neighborhood, in my opinion. In fact, this de development will directly benefit every single homeowner in Lake Forest, as the value of their homes will be positively impacted by these sales. Furthermore, the City of Lake Forest will benefit from this development financially through real estate taxes and transfer stamps. Earlier this year, Bob Kiley and Kathy Cerniak held their quarterly real estate professionals meeting. At this particular meeting, the City of Lake Forest asked specific questions about the state of our local <coughs> real estate market. One particular question from that meeting stood out, and that was, two-part question, what do buyers want that Lake Forest does not currently offer? And if buyers are going elsewhere, what is it that's attracting them to other communities? The answer is simple. Buyers want Oak Knoll Woodlands. Buyers want high quality, new construction designed for today's buyer. Much of Lake Forest's real estate has become obsolete. And no offense, but the city, but no offense. Little civility, please. The city of Lake Forest has made it very difficult to renovate, rebuild, or build anew. And even when successful, with the city's approval process, it is much too slow and burdensome. Other North Shore communities are much more willing to work with buyers and builders. And as a result, many buyers, builders, and developers are specifically avoiding Lake Forest because of the challenges of getting approval through the city and the length of time it takes to get approval. Winnetka is one of these communities that has been more, quote unquote, open to change. It certainly helps explain why the average sale price for a single family home in Winnetka is almost $500,000 higher than one here in Lake Forest. In closing, I ask the Plan Commission tonight to take the first step in improving the Lake Forest approval process. As such, I sincerely hope that you fully approve the proposed Oak Knoll subdivision and that you expedite the entire approval process. We need to improve our city approval process, and it starts here tonight with the approvals of Oak Knoll Woodlands and the Spiel subdivision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pasquese. <clears throat> Ma'am, I, I understand you're the person who gave up your time. Um, no, a, that was the girl behind me. Pardon me? That was the lady behind me, correct? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, can I speak? All right. Good Where's afternoon it? or good evening. Ladies first, my apologies. Um, so I just wanted to follow up on uh, two of my neighbors' um, items. So. Uh, Remus, the speaker before the realtor. Um, one of the things he ended his uh, discussion on was the aspect of bias. And we want to avoid bias in this whole process and bias in this discussion. Then we had the preceding speaker, the Excuse realtor. Me one second. What's your name and where do you live? Sorry, it's Claire Tracy, 1381 Conway Road. Thank you. Then we had the next speaker stand, the realtor. And I think that answers a question of bias as well. But I'll proceed. I object to the um, request to reduce the zone change from R5 to R4 because as a lot of people have talked about here this evening, the overall land area, square footage, acreage of the proposed lot size to be built is not what's intended in the city's council's remit. As the Lake Forest City Council, I think it's your responsibility and your remit to protect that. I think that's why, back to the realtor's comment, there is a lot of disapprovals in our society to make sure that we do preserve our community, our land space accordingly. So the question as to a reduced number of smaller lot sizes available in our community, I would ask the question, why is that the case? It's the case because we protect Lake Forest. It's the case because we want to protect our community that we live in, that we value, and that leads us to the quality of life that we enjoy. And we want to protect our community so that it's there for our children, including my three and a half year old for the future. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, thank you. My name is uh, Charlie Asfor at 1596 Conway Road. You know, I, speaking of, of bias, you can see my property right here. I think that probably implies I'm pretty unbiased about all of this. Uh, we've lived at, at 1596 Conway for about a year. Uh, my wife, Rebecca, spoke in front of you at the last meeting. We have two children, a four-year-old and a seven-month-old. 
We, uh, our property is a little unique here because despite our mailing address being on Conway Road, we derive access to our property via Stablewood Lane through a series of easements, uh, which you can see are labeled as the existing driveway right there. We, uh, when we bought this property, we immediately started discussions with Rick and uh, have been sp speaking with the petitioner for over 11 months now. I'd say that those discussions have been constructive and cordial, and him and his attorney have been very flexible during this whole process. When, we, when my wife came in front of the commission last meeting, we expressed our support for the R4 zoning, but also expressed a handful of concerns that we had. The first concern was that this may substantially change the character of our property. We had concerns about this impacting the value of our property. We had concerns about reducing the amount of privacy that our property currently enjoys. And we had concerns about the development impacting the level of safety that our property currently enjoys. Obviously, because of these concerns and because of the young age of our children and the character of our property, we immediately started these discussions with the petitioner. Indicated. And the discussions overall have gone well. We, we believe that our property takes its character from the homes on Stablewood Lane. And we've recently reached an agreement with the petitioner through, like I said, 11 months of constructive discussions. And we believe the agreement addresses the concerns that we had. And we don't believe the smaller lot sizes nor the value of these homes that will be built here impact our property at all. Uh, we, we believe that, again, the, the discussions with, with the petitioner have been constructive. We have two of the three necessary signatures on our agreement. I've been assured the third signature is coming. And with that assurance, we're here to support the development. Uh, specifically, we, we subject to our agreement and subject to the parties performing under that agreement, subject to the city granting the development approvals that are consistent with that agreement. We're in full support of the proposed development, including the number of lots requested and the configuration of the lots requested. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Hal Frank. I'm Mr. and Mrs. Asfor's attorney. You may recall I appeared at the first session of the public hearing and, as Charlie said, expressed the support uh, for the request for R4 rezoning, rezoning to R4, but still identified some concerns, as Mr. Asfor uh, reiterated again this evening, which we believe now uh, have been addressed through the petitioner. And I just wanted to uh, I, I actually did not intend to speak, but there was one point now based on the new evidence that's presented to you that I did want to address. I also want to just uh, reiterate what Charlie said, which is we've been, I haven't been involved for 11 months, but I counted up. I think it's been close to six months that I've been working with Mr. Swanson and his attorney, Mr. Iden. And, and as, as Charlie said, they've been uh, completely open, cordial, frank, and very uh, easy to work with. And it's taken us many, many drafts of an agreement, but we have uh, come to an agreement and we pre appreciate the cooperation. Uh, the one comment that I wanted to address of a substantive basis was to follow up on the, on the uh, materials that I appreciate uh, Lauren Sundberg has presented to you this evening that I haven't seen until just now and, and I assume you haven't seen either. And I appreciate the efforts and I appreciate the arguments that she's made. The one point that I would like to, to note uh, and, and this also a little bit dovetails on what Mr. Pesquese just said to you. Uh, the implication seems to have been made that because of the considerations that were done at the time of the approval of uh, Phase 1C of Conway Farms, that somehow uh, the city of Lake Forest is now bound by comments, thoughts, statements that were made more than 20 years ago. Uh, and I know that I don't need to tell you, and I'm sure that you would be advised by your own attorney, that when you reach your determination and recommendation to the city council, and the city council makes its recommendation, 
uh, or its determination on any uh, specific request for approval. Obviously, both of you have the discretion to take into account changes in facts, changes in circumstances, uh, changes in laws that have taken place. The, the comments that were shared with you uh, this evening, again, go back over 20 years. And I, I don't know if there are residents in, uh, of Stablewood Lane here this evening and how they would uh, chime in on the issue of connecting uh, this development to Stablewood Lane. But obviously they have the right to express their opinion, whether they are, would be in support of it or against it, they'd have an interest in that debate, and they'd certainly not be precluded from suggesting to the city that times have changed and that that connection no longer be made. I'm not aware of any uh, document that obligates the city to construct a public road over this locket parcel access easement. I have the, ac the actual easement document that says when, this, when a public road is constructed over the easement, it, uh, either by the city or a contractor acting with the approval of the city, the easement goes away. But I didn't see any documents so far that obligates the city to approve a plan uh, that connects this proposed development to Stablewood Lane. And I would respectfully suggest uh, that the city does have the discretion to recognize changes in law and circumstances to say that is no longer our, what we determine to be in the best interests of the community. The zoning ordinance, as you know, is one tool in your toolkit, the city's toolkit. And you have the right to determine, as Mr. Pasquese said, that what's in the best interest of the city now is not another development of one and a half acre lots. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> one more testifier, and then I'm going to call a, a five minute break. Okay. Commissioners, uh, my name is Ron Lamb. Uh, I live at 500 Stablewood Lane. So on behalf of those people that live on Stablewood, I hope I can address that concern. There should be a letter in your packet uh, that I submitted on behalf of my uh, sense of this development and uh, the need for it. I think Mr. Pasquese uh, successfully pointed out the merit of it. I think one of the things that's missing that I would like to address on behalf of this is the passionate and spirited debate that has occurred on behalf of this. And I think it's critical that people who are for and against things appear on behalf of, of these suggestions. Um, each of us has a responsibility to think about our own property. But at the same time, I think we want to not lose sight of what it means to invite people to come to Lake Forest, what it means to be here, and how people could afford uh, to actually have a parcel that's here. Um, the, at 500 Stablewood, I don't suggest that the character of our neighborhood, because we don't have the same number of trees, is any different than what you have. What we have are wonderful schools, and what we have are great committed people. I am deeply insulted by the assumption that someone made about the impropriety of suggesting that there's a consultant that's assisting Mr. Swanson and that therefore that somehow compromises Ms. Cerniak. If you've lived here long enough, you know that these people have our best interests in mind as well. It's hard to want to say what you say in the face of this. And I applaud you men for serving at the pleasure of the people who've appointed you. But here's what we need to understand. This development will make things better. You brought your own expert in May who decided as a paid expert that there were problems with the water. We also have all types of people who provide that determination. In thinking about what it could be, I believe it will be better. I think it will invite a number of people to afford our community and to enjoy the amenities of and this terrific community that we're a part of. To think that another developer could come and develop this parcel without the care, the commitment, and the experience that Rick Swanson had would, would be a shame. I do sense tonight 
that there's a better synergy and a sense of working together than I felt in May. And I hope that that continues. I really want to suggest that Stablewood would not be opposed to people coming down our street if it meant that they could live there and enjoy what was there. Now, I can't speak on behalf of the Homeowners Association. Those are votes, and those things happen on behalf of the tournament, and they happen on behalf of everything else. But what I can tell you is we should invite people to come and to afford to be here, and I hope that you will provide this tentative approval and expect that people will continue to work side by side to solve those issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to call for a five-minute recess that we convene back here at, uh, it is uh, 8.44 now, we'll convene back at 8.49. <clears throat> outside for a minute. <coughs> <coughs>
since we do have continue to have a quorum, we will proceed uh, without his uh, uh, input at this time. So we'll continue <clears throat> the public hearing. Uh, let me just have a show of hands. How many more people do we have that wish to testify? Okay, one, two. Okay, very good. And then because after that, we will then move to the uh, uh, cross-examination phase. Okay. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Sudak. I live at 1420 Abington Cams Drive. Um, and I'm against the project in its current form. Um, so what I understand is that there's 30 acres of property of which, 30, 30 acres of land, 30% of which is gonna to be tarmac for cluster housing, which is gonna have a substantial impact upon the water flow downstream. And just the ongoing maintenance is really my question of this wetlands. So are the homeowners are presumably gonna have the liability for the ongoing maintenance and care yes. of this particular wetland. And if something does happen where it's inefficient or there is a problem with the engineering of this whole process, mm -hmm. are you considering a standby letter of credit to be put in place or an insurance policy that can be tapped so that we are convinced that there's enough uh, money to be had to fix whatever or remedy whatever liability is caused? Um, and my second question, are these new homeowners, are they gonna be aware that they have of the liability of the ongoing preservation of this wetland and the costs associated with that? Or is this wetland gonna eventually be ceded to the town so that all these people who are against the actual project in itself actually get the eventual liability of this wetland? So I just wanna consider those facts and make sure that we are looking forward to what's going on with the project and not just doing a short-term fiscal fix because I don't think this project makes sense from um, an environmental standpoint, doesn't make sense from an aesthetic standpoint in the neighborhood and fiscally I'm not sure it makes sense either. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Dave Carlson, my wife Bonnie and I have lived at 1566 Conway Road for 28 years and eight days. Um, speak to two things, one, traffic. Uh, when the uh, golf course was built, uh, <coughs> city staff advised us in at least, at least one and maybe more than one public meeting that Stable wood would swing around uh, the existing property at the north end of the proposed development and tie in with Oak Knoll. There was really no question that the area would be developed. Um, that can't happen now, really can't, uh, just looking at the, the, the layout of things. You had two more shots at it and blew it. Um, you know, Tanglewood was already there. And somebody should have been smart enough to see that Leland uh, should have swung around to where, you know, Abington Cams was. And um, that would at least provide a little different outlet. Uh, we also uh, decided to make a walking path out of the easement for a road connecting uh, to Stablewood and whatever that street is at the other end of the walking road that's on the back end of uh, those properties along Oak Knoll. Uh, so we, we have what we have. And um, I, just, I just think that it's going to come out at Oak Knoll, but it ought to come out at my next point, which is the density issue. At the time, again, that the golf course was developed, um, Commitment was made. It was going to be acre and a half lots. Apparently, that has now been. I didn't know it was documented as well as it was. Apparently, it is. Um, throughout my business career, I've seen a lot of decisions made to reverse other decisions, and the effects have not been pleasant and kind. It just goes to the uh, integrity of the of the enterprise. 
I think that what we, uh, in, in opposition to the statement made that while times change, you've got to change with the times, uh, commitments were made. I consider those to be pretty ironclad. We should re maintain those commitments. And uh, you know, those are my two talking points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Carlson. <clears throat> Last call for anybody else who has changed their mind and wishes to testify. OK. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, I will, at this point, declare the public hearing on this matter closed. And we will <clears throat> next move to the uh, uh, cross-examination. We've had uh, two requests to appear and to cross-examine, uh, Lauren Sunberg and Paul Sunberg. Um, I think the, the main <clears throat> opportunity is for Mr. and Mrs. Sundberg to ask questions of the petitioner. Is that correct? Kathy, am I correct on that? So I think, <clears throat> do you still wish to cross-examine? Uh, no, thank you, sir. You, how about you, Mr. Sundberg? Uh, uh, I'm the advice of counsel. Okay, so let the record sh let the record show that uh, having applied to appear and to cross examine, uh, you have at the time in the agenda uh, you've declined to do so. Thank you. Okay, then we'll next go to uh, the. Uh, Staff response to public testimony. Kathy? Given the, the number of comments and questions that were raised, I, I guess in the, the hour, um, I would ask the commission, do you want us to, to go through that now? Uh, would you prefer that uh, we actually respond to you in writing, uh, addressing point by point? We can do it either way. Um. I think there would be merit to <clears throat> having some conversation among the commission, you know, between commissioners here, <clears throat> an open session, as to whether they wish to take the staff report and and um, take action on it or <clears throat> to follow Kathy's advice. Out of the public, I can just say, for, speaking for myself, there's at least four or five issues that have come up. <clears throat> Uh, that I would like, if we do decide to have staff do uh, a point-by-point -point response in that forum, uh, I would then, each of us could make sure that we have our items that we would like address to address. But is, it, is there any sense, I know that this has uh, been a long journey for the petitioner, but I'm just wondering whether the commissioner wishes to take action on this tonight or would like to uh, do as staff suggests? Because, I mean, based on the testimony, there's several issues that I want answers to. Yeah, I, I would be in favor of continuing it to allow those, those issues to be further discussed, resolved, and um, presented back to us and perhaps the larger quantity of the board members too to be take part in that decision making process but i think we got a lot of interesting input tonight and um, we saw a lot of new material from the petitioner and needs to be accommodated for providing additional materials but with all that there's probably a need to digest further after reviewing it this evening yeah i i understand that that point as well and I think as long as we can make special effort, Kathy, to just focus on these new issues that have brought up, been brought up and make a concerted effort to, to take, yeah. the, take the considerations of the petitioner and, and follow our process. What? Do you feel as though uh, in, in continuing and considering uh, a staff uh, uh, response to the points raised this evening that we should also incorporate uh, discussion points that might emerge from 
a discussion we had here this <laughs> evening amongst ourselves and then direct I think that would be fair but I, I would caution against getting into a debate on you know either yes or no on a particular thing I think we ought to try to focus it on what issues do we wish to still have more information on from staff okay does that make sense yeah I think I can go along with that could we could we uh, maybe uh, there might be constructive uh, alternatives or uh, other aspects that uh, if you wish to uh, direct staff to that effect I think that's I, I, I'm throwing it open okay. to discussion amongst well, ourselves. Let, let me start I mean one of the issues that I would like further information on Kathy are number one <clears throat> staff comment on the density transfer issue in writing if we can get it um, the stable wood access question we were presented with information tonight that I frankly haven't had a time to look at uh, but uh, <clears throat> I think that's an issue bike and pedestrian traffic situation I think was something new that we heard about tonight and most importantly in my mind the questions that were raised at the end of the public comment or testimony is that a question of liability of the homeowners association relative to protection and maintenance of wetlands and drainage I'd like uh, <clears throat> more on that I think I know the answer but I don't want to I don't want to assume I know something that perhaps I don't so that anything yeah, the particulars of, of what the covenants would be of the agreement did you hear that Kathy the covenants of the agreement the particulars on those covenants would you consider uh, adding to that uh, some uh, clarification of the comprehensive plan as it relates to the statement that subsequent zoning would result in something between R4 and R5 and uh, a comment towards the end of the public testimony uh, as to how binding the comprehensive plan is or is that something the plan can commission can consider modifying and also uh, uh, there was a, there was the issue of uh, defining uh, what buildable area really means uh, how it's actually defined in the ordinances With the 1A on that, what is the actual setback on the the buffer setback for the high quality wetlands and for the low quality wetlands? Yeah. And then if we could just make a point of clarification for the commission on Guy's point about to what extent should we be considering the limits to bulk square footage being built, designed, so that's what, what you had mentioned as well. <coughs> but, and are we just to consider that? I don't know that we need to put that as part of the process but where we need to consider what role this commission will play in determining that okay Kathy I have another one and that is the statement in the Sunberg letter that <clears throat> the application of an overlay district is inappropriate in this K in this uh, situation I'd like your comments on that And, and Kathy feel free you know after you go through the <clears throat> your notes and if you <clears throat> take a look at the uh, uh, the tape of the meeting of the public testimony if, if other things <clears throat> come to mind feel free to add those as well okay okay <clears throat> Shall we make a motion? Yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, make a motion that we uh, continue consideration of this petition to the next monthly meeting of the Plan Commission. Second. I second that. Second. Uh, all those in favor say of continuation say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Kathy, I would also suggest <clears throat> that 
given uh, <clears throat> agenda items and so forth, if it would be appropriate for a special <clears throat> meeting. Uh, speaking as chairman, I would be open to that in an effort to <clears throat> move the petition along and get a decision, a recommendation of the council one way or the other. Okay, and, and just to clarify, we will uh, provide uh, public notice as required. So the meeting wouldn't be next week, for instance. So we will see if we can schedule that, or it may be at the next regularly scheduled meeting, depending if there's a meeting date available. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next item is uh, public hearing and action on consideration of a request for final approval of the Spiel Plan Preservation Subdivision 10-acre parcel on the north side of Wesley Road, west of Green Bay Road. Mr. Swanson. Long night, gentlemen. No, I understand. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the Plan Commission, um, I'm here tonight uh, to present final approval. I was actually waiting, Mr. Chairman, until it cleared out. Would, that's, should I? that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Uh, I'm here tonight to present the Spiel subdivision. Um, by way of uh, background, uh, the Spiels were here in 2012 and received approval from the then plan commission uh, and the city council for uh, the, the subdivision we're gonna pre present tonight. So tonight is really just the results of all of that and we're asking tonight for final approval of our, our uh, development plan. We are the contract purchasers uh, for the record. We're working with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Spiel um, and, and our, our hope is to, uh, to get approval and, and move forward. Uh, with that said, I'm going to hopefully. Uh, yes, you are. It's not showing up on the screen, unfortunately. Ah, there we go. Perfect. Uh, by way of review, we'll go through the background, the planning process, the stormwater management, and the landscape elements. Uh, background, the, purchase, the property was purchased tw uh, uh, 20 acres in 1945. Uh, built a home in 1947 at the Stanley Anderson House. Uh, very well uh, uh, cared for. Uh, family ownership for over uh, uh, 65 years. As I pointed out earlier, uh, we are now the contract purchasers for this property. A property is located, as uh, you're, I'm sure you're aware, uh, j directly north of Red Fox on Wesley. It's on the uh, north side of Wesley Road. Uh, it's a six lot subdivision uh, and there is a, an existing house, as I pointed out earlier, right here. And in fact, there's an existing driveway that runs along this, tri this line of spruce all the way to the, uh, to the garage. Go. <laughs> lots of lots of distractions tonight. <laughs> um, the planning process and natural features. The the site has some uh, significant trees, uh, which I'll talk about tonight. Uh, very interesting top topography. Uh, site access um, is an issue. Obviously, we want to align with uh, Red Fox. It is a private road versus a public road. Uh, the existing house location has, has been respected in terms of how we've done the planning for this. And of course, we've gone through the staff review. <coughs> As I referenced earlier, there's two incredible specimens on the site. These are heritage trees. And I'll be referencing these uh, a couple times in my presentation tonight, but they're actually beautiful specimens. Um, the, there is also a grove of spruces that runs along the driveway, as I in initially indicated. Uh, we plan to preserve that and, in fact, enhance it. As I referenced earlier, the topography, uh, it f the water flows from the northeast uh, corner of the site to the southwest corner of the site and to an existing 
uh, man-made detention pond. It's actually a, a, a wetland now. We do plan to do a private road, and it will have a rural character. It'll be an eight 18 foot wide cross section, and uh, very, very interesting, very exciting uh, approach to uh, to this development. Uh, as I indicated earlier, there's a, a, an existing Stanley Anderson home on the property. It's our intent to, of course, preserve that. There might be some enhancements made to it, and of course, we would appear before the Lake Forest uh, Historic Preservation Board uh, for any alterations that we may uh, make to the house. Uh, as indicated earlier, the fire enge final engineering plans, conditions of approval were as follows. Uh, final engineering plans include approval of outside agencies, wetland mit mitigation credits uh, have been paid and, and have been uh, given. Uh, preservation of the existing topography, uh, which we have done. Uh, street name uh, submitted and uh, approved. Uh, we are, we're working with Meadowbrook Court right now. Kathy's confirming whether that's okay with, uh, with the fire department and so on. Um, final plat, uh, no further development of outlot A, which is essentially the area that uh, encompasses the, uh, the pond, uh, the proposed pond. Uh, there will be an HOA for perpetual maintenance of the private road and infrastructure. You actually referenced that in a previous uh, pre petition, and in fact, we would have that set up, and it's fairly common in the City Lake Forest. Uh, new homes to include residential sprinkler systems, it's fairly academic. Uh, tree preservation plan, which we have submitted and has been reviewed. Uh, landscape buffer, uh, landscape buffer uh, has been provided uh, uh, behind uh, lots one and two. Uh, in, and again, one of the disadvantages I have is I wasn't part of the initial approval process, but I was given the names of individuals who did speak at, the, uh, at that point, and we did reach out to all of them. There was one individual that I have met with recently, actually, uh, that was not given to me, but he did reach out and we did have a conversation about that. Uh, but for now, uh, the, the landscaping you see on this drawing is reflected primarily on the east and west uh, boundaries of the property. Uh, the eastern half of the, um, the 25 feet on that 50 foot buffer on this side, the east side, uh, would be preserved uh, uh, existing tree growth, and then we would embellish that with some additional pines and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, other landscaping along this edge. Uh, Tesca did the landscape plan on this and, and tried to use native uh, species, native plantings, and so forth. Um, there will be no play equipment allowed in this area. There will be no uh, pool structures or sheds of any kind. Um, well, we have recently met with... Um, uh, the north neighbor and discuss and have had discussions about uh, reasonable landscaping along the north boundary here and you'll see that we've actually added some pine trees in here this hasn't been sanctioned by either the owner to the north or by the 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 city staff but uh, we are open to discussion about how we might screen that uh, going forward uh, the declaration of covenants and restrictions have been submitted and we are uh, ready to pay city impact fees once we're ready to record the plat uh, the site plan, uh, we, as I indicated earlier, there's some very interesting uh, elements to this. We have a bridge element here and here. And what's interesting about this concept with this rural cross section is that we really embrace these existing heritage trees in the center. And you can see we've, we've made, uh, or, or I should say, uh, Tesca and Black have made a, a tremendous effort to really avoid these trees and stay outside the drip line. And by doing this rural cross section, we'll be incorporating rural uh, native gra uh, grasses in these areas. What's kind of neat about this is there's a trail that meandered through here as well. Uh, and that same uh, um, uh, feel and, and character will be uh, carried into this center uh, cul-de-sac area. Uh, we do plan to clean up some of the non-native species in this area and remove this, uh, the, the plantings in this, this area and, and replant it with native species and have a, a sort of a slight berm along this edge that leads into this, uh, this beautiful wetland feature. Uh, there is tree preservation. Uh, obviously, I've indicated earlier the heritage trees and, of course, that grove of spruce trees along the driveway. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, the flow of stormwater detention will flow from the north and uh, northeast uh, down to into the uh, proposed enhanced wet, uh, wetland feature and detention area, and it would be released into the stormwater uh, under um, Wesley Road. I'm going the wrong way, gentlemen. Uh, 
there will be naturalized detention. In other words, it will be a detention basin, but it'll be a natural wetland uh, uh, detention basin. So you'll have native plantings. It'll actually be a very striking, very beautiful natural feature. Uh, the uh, Spiel property is, uh, I think that's the end of my presentation, actually. Um, it is not the end of my presentation. This is what happens when the night goes long, Mr. Chairman. Wesley Berm, um, I, we did some, we had Tesco do some cross sections, and these are actually the exhibits that were presented initially and approved. Of course, this is Wesley Road, and this is that trail that I described sort of meandering through the property, and it'll walk, wrap around the pond. This little berm, sort of a soft undulating berm with spruce and, and as I indicated, native plantings, and it's essentially the cross section here and here. And then, of course, this is the cross section at the entrance point, and we'll have a little boulevard, uh, a little bit of a bridge feature with fencing and stone wall. Um, it, it, as you can see, this is the stone material we're proposing. Uh, and again, the, uh, the islands and so forth that'll be created uh, with w Wesley Road. So this is essentially what you would see between these two points. And then finally, uh, the boardwalk and pond. We are proposing a boardwalk, which you can see is right here. That will take you out into this, and it connects to the uh, to the existing uh, the proposed uh, trail that we're we're putting in. It wraps around and through the property. Your comment earlier. Uh, one of the, the uh, plan commission members uh, asked if we were um, going to connect that to, and that would be available to the public. It would clearly be a public access way. We're not going to prohibit people from walking through the development. Again, this is a cross-section through that proposed bridge element. And that concludes my presentation, uh, gentlemen. I'm ready for any questions you may have. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Kathy? Thank you, Chairman Lay. This is a request for final approval of the Spiel Planned Preservation Subdivision. Um, in uh, 2012, and, and probably for at least a, a year before that, uh, actually, um, Mr. Spiel, the property owner, and I know he was here earlier. He is still here, uh, along with his attorney, Mr. Byram. Um, they brought forward uh, a subdivision uh, that was the result of, of much discussion. Um, the Plan Commission uh, held public hearings on this subdivision, I believe, in February and March of 2012. Um, interestingly, at the February meeting, uh, the, the matter, um, I think, was, was almost voted on and then was uh, decided to, the commission decided to continue it to really ponder the question of whether five larger lots would be better than six smaller lots. Um, and we came back to the commission uh, a month later and uh, talked about the value of, of the smaller lots. This also is a property that's in the overlay district. It is zoned R4. Um, in this subdivision, you see lots that approach two acres and lots that are barely an acre. Um, so within this six lot subdivision, you see a variety of lot sizes. Um, uh, this property also has an area in the uh, southwest corner that is not developable. Um, it is a wetland area, um, and that area much like you saw earlier tonight, a conventional plan was done that showed how many lots at the required 60,000 square feet could be placed on this property. Um, what you have is the result of a lot of discussion. Uh, this property has a significant uh, change in topography, which actually makes it a, an incredible property. The first time I, I went up there, I was pretty amazed. Um, it, it really will be a one-of-a-kind subdivision. Uh, it, it does a lot to address the water flow that currently just flows uncontrolled right now across the property because you have that uh, higher uh, eastern side by Green Bay Road flowing into the, um, into the drainage ditch. Um, you have a creative plan in front of you. Uh, this plan did receive tentative approval from the city council uh, in 2012 based on the recommendation of the plan commission. Uh, since that time, uh, Mr. Spiel has kept, has done everything required to keep that tentative approval alive. Uh, he has come before the city council, I think, twice uh, to uh, file for the appropriate extensions. Uh, from the beginning, um, my understanding was that Mr. Spiel eventually would, would market this family property. 
Um, and uh, in recent months, uh, Mr. Swanson and, and his team has stepped forward um, to finalize this development. What you have in front of you does meet all the conditions of approval. Um, certainly as we move forward, I know there's been interest from surrounding property owners in having an appropriate buffer. Uh, setbacks are provided on the plat, but as we look at the plans for individual lots, we will certainly also look at perimeter landscaping, but importantly, we will work closely with the city engineer to make sure that landscaping is not planted in areas that will uh, conflict with overland flow routes. Finally, I did want to mention that the wetland on this property, the, the detention area, as with all subdivisions uh, that have been done within the last 10, 15 years, that area is the responsibility of the homeowners association. Uh, that is detailed in the Declaration of Covenants. That responsibility is, is uh, placed with the homeowners association. And right on the face of the plat, again, all, as with all plats, the city retains the uh, responsibility, the obligation, that if that area is not being properly maintained, the state, city steps in, does that maintenance, and then charges back the homeowners association. Uh, that's consistent. Um, you do have a number of, of final conditions of approval uh, that as we work through this, we will make sure all those details are addressed. Staff does recommend uh, final approval of the plat of the Spiel subdivision and the associated special use permit. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. <clears throat> Any questions of uh, petitioner or of staff? I, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> First of all, while Rick's coming back, Kathy, maybe this is an appropriate time. Throughout the city, there are these covenants that are established for, for private roads and, and the like with amenities and, and wetlands. And things. How often does it occur that there are severe complications with, uh, with the maintenance of, of various types of um, wetlands or uh, roads, you know, things of that nature that we've seen uh, in both petitions tonight? It, it doesn't really occur that much. We certainly get questions. Uh, we get questions from homeowners associations uh, who, who um, want input on how to address issues. Um, sometimes we get calls from homeowners associations who want to give away some of those private responsibility. Uh, the city council uh, has been very clear that once a development is approved with those facilities, that infrastructure is private, that that, that does remain private. Um, but I don't recall a situation where the city has had to step in and, uh, um, for instance, dredge a detention pond or, or do wetland maintenance. If something needs to be done, we do communicate with those homeowners associations, um, and I think we have a, a pretty good response. Lake County has recently started holding work sessions, educational sessions for homeowners associations. So we get that information out to association board members and encourage them to attend that. Yeah, and there's a general uh, growing awareness of the average homeowner in in areas in Lake County. I think that the sort of stewardship of land is becoming um, a, a real desired um, responsibility too. So I, I, it's good to hear your comments on 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 how successful it seems to be progressing. Uh, one question I had, and, and Rick, you can help me out with this, and it's also directed at Kathy. On my submittal, I, I saw the limestone retaining wall at the entry to this. Yes. And maybe you could put the slide up for that sure. again, if you would, please. Thanks, Rick. <clears throat> um, and we could, and, and let's look at it. Is that it. the slide you were looking for, I, th Bert? I think so. It, it appears that at your entry, you have retaining walls indicated on your plan. And is this, so, I mean, out at the street, something that we actually see from the, yes, I think this is at the entry. Now, the retaining walls are parallel to the road, and those are necessary because of retaining earth. Yes, because, because of the through. undulating the berm that that was proposed. Right to cut across from Red Fox Lane on the opposite side correct. of the street, you need you need to do this from for for actual uh, earth holding. That's correct. You know, okay. it's serving a purpose. So you're not really planning on turning these walls to face Wesley and placing some kind of a of a distinctive entry feature that's marking this out as far as a separate development. I mean, that's not part of what you're thinking, is it? No, I mean? it's it's actually just a very subtle uh, okay. separate, yes. Okay, that I just wanted to make sure we right. weren't doing something that was a little 
bit more. I, I like the fact that this is across from Red Fox Lane. I think that that probably as much Rick as it might be the city, and I think that you all both are in agreement with that because it shows a continuity of traffic and of street fabric. Now, is the is the road across the street is that private or is that a public road? I'm pretty sure Red Fox is a public street, but someone could correct me. Because it's a cul-de-sac road as well, and it's so not. That's what I recall. It's public. Yeah, that is public. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like the fact that you're right across, though, because the perception upon traveling around our streets is that there's a fabric that's that has continuity, and it's not just that. And perhaps you should even just call it Red Fox Circle, just to let people when they pass it, you've got to. I'm open to anything yeah. at this point. Well, as long that's as my it's, thought. Okay, those yeah. answer my questions uh, sure. for now. Thank you. Further questions of petitioner or Kathy? Is is this final plat the same as the uh, tentative plat? Yes. And so the uh, outlot B is the same as it was in the tentative plat? Yes. Okay. Just a quick question on limiting pools and play areas to the east boundary. What, why not the north and the west? And the, how do you enforce that? And it's, it's actually, let me clarify that. Um, if I may, if I, there we go. That's actually a good slide. What I was saying is that we couldn't put play sets and pools in this area, not in these backyards. They could have pools, they can have play sets, they just can't have them in this landscape area that's been proposed. This is a 50 foot landscape buffer from the lot line to here, 25 of which is preserved existing vegetation which is what I believe the property owner to the east requested. And we added some further embellishment here with, uh, with pine trees, and I, th I think that's hackberry trees. And so why not the north and the, and the west boundaries? Uh, because it wasn't re requested. We, didn't add, we weren't asked to do it. We're actually in the process of talking to that's this. That's a good answer. We just weren't. I mean, the, that's a good the answer. reality is, is that uh, it's, it, 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 the reality is there is a lot of vegetation around this site, and it's existing. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not being sarcastic. That's no, no, I, and I, 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 I'm not hearing sarcasm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Further, uh, we uh, can now next move to public testimony. Is there anybody here who wishes to... Uh, to appear on this matter before us, sir, or let me have, let me swear you in first, and let me before I do that on this matter, I, I, I neglected to ask whether or not there's been any ex party communications, any of the members here on this matter. Seeing none, let the record show no ex party communications. Uh, those who are going to testify, please stand. Uh, raise your right hand. Get my script. And do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony you are about to give or have previously given is true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, I do. Thank you. Gentlemen, I'm Don. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I'm Don McCoy, and I live at 190 East Wesley. This is uh, the property immediately to the west of the Spiel property uh, facing Wesley Road. And I was, I've had time, much time since the 6th whenever I was told that this was coming up. And uh, so, actually today, I printed out the drawings and I looked at them and I said, these haven't changed since the last time around. And uh, on this letter, I had uh, Manhart consultants write up for me uh, on February 6, 2012. And I will quickly just <clears throat> hit the highlights and these things were promised to me by the uh, development 
developers, uh, I believe it was the engineer and attorney at the time, they said, we'll do these. Uh, and uh, the first one was <clears throat> the gravel walkway. First, I think this is a beautiful subdivision, beautiful. Uh, but there are a couple of things here. One is the gravel walkway that uh, you can see up there that goes it's on the left-hand side uh, from the pond. That's uh, 20 feet away from the lot line. And not only is it 20 feet away from the lot line, which is what, from about there to where you're sitting, uh, but it's also elevated by about, uh, in maybe you can tell me how much is it is it elevated by about six feet from uh, where my property is. So that means people are walking right past there, looking right down into my bedroom, my uh, patio, my uh, bedroom window, bathroom windows. So what I did, I, I requested that they uh, move that into 50 feet and uh, from the common property line. The, and obviously there's, I see nothing that, uh, where they've done anything since the last meeting that we had. Uh, the uh, next one is, uh, Uh, I requested that uh, they put in a screen of pine trees or the like. Uh, 20 feet south of our front patio to uh, just back uh, behind our lot. And the reason for that again is to keep people from looking down in there. It isn't that I oppose being having a next door neighbor, I just opposed having somebody way up here looking down at us, uh, as I'm sure you would too. <laughs> uh, okay, also I noticed that uh, they put a uh, no fencing and uh, no pools along the lot line on the uh, east side. And that's one also that I had uh, requested that no fences be put along there. Uh, pretty much, we don't have any fences over there uh, except right up at Wesley Road. But all the neighbors' yards, you know, they sort of tie together. Uh, they have some screening in between them, but they tie together. Uh, and that was uh, one that uh, they'd agreed to. I don't know who I'm looking at here. Who was it that told me that you were going to do this? Was it you? No, you weren't here. I wasn't here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I have a question if I may. Yeah. Your, your property, does it, is it, uh, it faces Westlake, does it go along the boundary of the wetland, the proposed wetland? Does something move around here? Do we have a mouse or something? Sorry, so I just want to make it clear. Okay, I'll even help you. Is it here, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. You know better than that. <laughs> right, didn't I stand have to on share the, the microphone with me? The west side of the steel property. I, I, the question I was asking, oh, I'm sorry, is are you, uh, your property is here, correct? That's right. Does it go this far or does it go all the way back uh, to here? It goes, I believe, just, oh, we can see the thing up. Uh, right here is the easement, okay. that's, that's what I and so it goes right up to right there. Okay, so, okay. So here it says Don. That's it. Right. There's the area already. Yeah. Thank you. Good job. Right on. Uh, another concern was the. Uh, 
Okay, the overflow elevation on the pond right here, <coughs> and uh, the overflow elevation right in here is at uh, 675.55, and the berm is at 676. And uh, I ask that that be looked at because it doesn't seem like it's very much. When that thing gets filled up, it really pours out of there. Right now, we have a lot of water that'll uh, uh, that comes <coughs> right over through here when that thing uh, overflows. How do I know if it overflows? We have so many urchins and creatures going across our driveways out of this world. Might get to be a foot deep. And, and then it all goes away. It goes down to the people to the, um, to the west of us. And the people to the west of us, whenever you get down towards the creek, they get a lot of water down there. And uh, part of that, I believe, is because the uh, culverts and the ditches haven't been properly maintained. And I doubt if there's sufficient size, even though you still have, I think, a 12-inch uh, pipe that comes out of that thing. I doubt if there's sufficient size to handle all that water coming down there. They aren't now, and uh, this is even more area. So that's an area that has to be looked at. And uh, OK, then I, the next one I had was the <coughs> downstream uh, culverts and uh, the swale. Uh, and it's the same as it was on the drawing the last time, but the swale going up through here, uh, it would appear that it isn't sufficiently severe to direct the water. Thank you for letting me use your picture here. This is most helpful. Uh, if I could keep this mouse under control. The swale coming down through here. Uh, to make the water that's flowing in this direction hit the swale and come down into the pond because otherwise it, it's going to come right down through here in my yard and then have to flow out and down and the neighbor property which is just to the north of me uh, they're going to catch a lot of that water too because everything from Oh, what is the road up here? I can't remember the name of it. Somebody help me. Uh, way up here, all the water. Oh. No, no, up, no, up above. <coughs> North uh, Green Bay. Everything from Green Bay Road. All the water from that point on flows in this direction, <coughs> and it's a lot of water. I didn't hear. But it's caught by the pond, and. Doesn't cause me a lot of problem right now, but I'm afraid this is going to cause more. Particularly Sir, the people down. Could you kind of okay. wrap up your testimony, please? Okay, I'll wrap it up. The last one is I want to make sure that uh, <laughs> during the summer months that the uh, work hours over there are from uh, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, and no work on Saturdays and Sundays. And you have to have dust abatement. You have to have trucks that are sprinkling water to keep the dust out. Uh, and I will leave you with these. I'm sure all of these things are things that we can work out. But I was disappointed that uh, there wasn't anything on the plans for them. And we all know if it isn't in the plans and notes, chances are it isn't going to get done. Thank you, John. Yeah. Thank you. You had a we'll, question? We'll have. Uh... Mr. Swanson, comment on your testimony. At okay, and in terms of it's when it's his turn. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Further testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Is give my plan back? <laughs> uh, yes. Thank you. But you gave that. Please state your name and address, please. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, I'm Ed Gillette. I'm at uh, 255 Foster Place. It's the property. Oh, this actually works good. It's the property uh, to the
to the north. We're running probably 80% of this uh, property line we share <coughs> with, with the Spiel property. Uh, my concern, uh, I think it's going to be a similar theme we're hearing, uh, is one of privacy. Uh, currently, we're, we have a three and a half acre property, uh, and uh, we have a lot of privacy right now. Uh, I talked with um, when when uh, Rob Spiel and his uh, design consultants had uh, first approached us with us, and they were very proactive about it, which I was very thankful for. Um, we talked about the fact that there's a, a 20 foot thick hedge that runs the length of this property. And in the summer, you're, you're isolated as a, as a result of it. And um, also that in the winter, when we look out, uh, we saw fields. We didn't see a house, which is what we'd see now. So we talked with them and we reached an agreement that they assured us that the hedge would remain and that they would take care of a landscaping plan which would uh, address our concerns in the winter. So based on that, we didn't oppose the, uh, the plans when they went forward because this really is a very nice development. I would agree with, with everyone on that. But our opinion would change, obviously, if we weren't able to maintain our privacy. Um, so we were a little surprised when we saw the plans and we were expecting to see something like this up here, and we, we don't see that now. So that's that's my concern, and I'm hope um, I did contact um, Rick, and he came out on Monday and we walked the property, and we had a constructive conversation, but we didn't reach a conclusion. And uh, I would just echo the the other comments, which is if it's not in the plan, uh, it's not probably going to happen. So I want to ensure it gets in the plan. That's my concern. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. My name is Howard Elies. I own the property at 303 Butler. That's in the uh, northwest corner of this property. Um, Two points. One, I had written a letter back in March of 2012 to Kathy requesting that the landscaping be continued north to my north property line to screen this subdivision. I see nothing has changed since then. Also, um, it'd be nice if I could put this grading plan up, but I'd like to have, there is a 30 foot wide drainage easement that continues on the west property lines and when it gets up to the north end, this, there is no swale to pick up all the water that's coming from the east and direct it down to the pond. As a result, the water spills over into my property. Now my property is, well, let's say from the north, my back north east property line to Butler Drive falls approximately 18 feet on that side. As a result, when the water comes down, it pools next to my driveway because the ground flattens out and takes days to drain down to Butler Drive. So what I'm re asking is if the petitioner could continue that swale northward and pick up all the water so it doesn't come down my backyard. I don't know, I have a map or grading plan here if you'd like to, I don't know how to work this screen here if you wanted to look at it. Any questions? I have none. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> we'll get the petitioner to respond. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm on the I'm at 320 East Wesley, uh, so that's the property. Immediately and your name, sir? Sanjeev Anand. Thank you. Been there for 19 years, and uh, so I have the property which is ex just uh, east of uh, it. That it pretty much uh, is adjacent to the three plots, and going back to 2012 we would have preferred there were five units not six but that's behind us now so i think in consideration of that 
what we had requested was sufficient screening. Uh, so I see that, and I've actually had conversations with Rick, and uh, we had a good constructive conversation, and I absolutely have uh, every belief that uh, you know Rick will you know live up to you know the basic spirit here. One Rick wasn't there. The one thing which we had, I'd asked for the additional planting which is going to be done to get the 50 <coughs> foot buffer. I want to make sure the plants were not so short that it takes four, five, six, seven years for them to grow. So one of the thoughts was we wanted the plants to be of sufficient height, you know, when they're planted in up front, so that you do get, you know, the barrier, you know, over a period, you know, uh, from the right away. Uh, we will have three houses built next to ours. So I think the one of the questions which has already been raised, so I just reinforce that, that have the construction be limited Monday through Friday, you know, during the business hours, not on the weekends, and of course the dust abatement. Uh, I have no reason to believe, I think Rick's been here for a long period of time. Uh, we have some other connections also, and I have no reason to believe that Rick will not live up to those, uh, you know, agreements. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Uh, Kathy's staff response to uh, public testimony. Uh, thank you, Chairman Lay. Um, a couple of responses. Um, I, there was a lot of discussion about the perimeter landscape treatment, and, and you do see here um, on the conceptual landscape plan some different landscape treatments in different areas. I, I think that taking into account the comments that we've heard, uh, we can certainly work with the developer on, on the specific, on the detailed landscape plan to uh, make sure that uh, there's adequate screening. Um, I don't think as part of the tentative approval, uh, certainly there was a lot of focus um, on the east side because you have three lots uh, that, that do abut that property directly to the east. So there was a special setback and special treatments talked about for that area. Uh, but there wasn't necessarily in t an intent that no, no, that um, surrounding houses would not see it, see these houses at all. So there is that balance. Um, with respect to drainage, I, I will defer to um, the engineers that are in the room. Uh, but I do know that we um, looked carefully to make sure we weren't taking water um, that already runs east to west across this property down toward Butler um, and inappropriately directing it all south so that it crosses Mr. McCoy's property. So there's, there's that balance of given the change in topography, there, there is some recognition that water's already running across this property. Um, and then the third and final item I wanted to address, the city does have overall construction hours um, that apply throughout the community. Those construction hours um, do start at 7 a.m. rather than 8, um, and they do allow construction on the weekends. Um, so I, normally we don't set special construction hours. Uh, uh, certainly that can be something that can be worked out and, and discussed. Um, sometimes we hear from neighbors that they'd rather get the work done quicker than, than have it drag on. So I just wanted to make it clear that we do have regular construction hours and we do work with developers to make sure those are are adhered to. Kathy, regarding the screening is, and I don't, I just did a quick scan, I, I see nothing in the final conditions that deal with the screening. Is it appropriate to put something in there regarding that, or is that something that's a purview of BRB? I think it's it's perfectly appropriate to put something in there. There is language that speaks specifically to the east side. Uh, certainly a condition that directs that, uh, um, depending on where homes are sited, the need for screening might be different or the need for a type of screening. So certainly a condition that directs that um, as uh, development plans come in for lots five and six, particular attention should be paid to maintaining the privacy of properties to the north and the west. Um, again, I, I think we have to acknowledge um, that plantings are going to have to respect anywhere where overland flows need to happen on this property. But certainly that could be added as a 
as a specific condition that would need to be addressed both through the specific land plan um, and as specific site plans come in so that we know where the garage is located, where the driveway is located, and where the house is located. That will help us identify where those plantings need to be. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Can we ask some more questions? Sure. Of Kathy or the petitioner? Either. <clears throat> Fire away. 50-foot um, setback for the path was requested. Is, is that problematic or? <coughs> Actually, I was just talking to my consultant, and he reminded me that um, th this could be easily solved. This path was modified. We no longer have it going around the pond this way uh, out of respect for that concern. So it el essentially eliminates the, the, the problem. Um, Actually, this is a, this exhibit wasn't the landscape architect didn't modify the exhibit to take this trail out of here. This colored exhibit, it's more for illustrative purposes. That's that's a simple answer. I'm sure so that's really I'm, not I'm, a problem. I'm sure it'll be well. It, it, it won't be an, an issue because you won't have anybody walking back there other than maybe the occasional person maintaining the the wetland area. But that's that's it. So just to be clear, there will not be a path on the west side of the pond. Is That's that, co that is correct. Correctly? Yes, and it's reflected on the final drawings that were submitted. It's just for this purpose, for our presentation purposes, we just happened to grab an exhibit that still had that path going around the pond. Okay. That's all. Uh, excuse me. You sent me drawings on the 6th last month. That path is on all 20 locations. It's right here. And it's the, it's the only drawing that was submitted. You can do it from there. <laughs> I love it when these things solve themselves. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the trail here, and it comes up, and it comes down to this boardwalk, or viewing platform in the wetland, and then the trail along the other side of the road. But at one time, this trail did loop around. We had it at 20 feet originally, and uh, after we talked to the neighbor, we did move it to 30. And then uh, once this got into final engineering in the last couple months, it just got removed from the plan. And, uh, that, that answers my questions. Thank yeah. you. Um, the, uh, how about the issue of water flow from east to west, uh, Kathy? Uh, I, did I understand you to mean that there is a natural migration of drainage from east to west and some of it has to continue? I'm going to defer to the engineers in the room to speak <clears throat> to that. There, uh, there is a big drainage problem with uh, the drainage going from east to west through uh, Mr. McCoy's property. I've seen it and it, it does, uh, uh, right now it's just coming right through right about here and it goes right across his front yard uh, and out his front driveway. Uh, and with this plan, we are putting a berm in along that side so that it contains the water and it isn't allowed to go across the lot line. And it, it leaves the, uh, the site through a pipe and then out into the uh, ditch along Wesley. And there's an overflow uh, in this location. Uh, the elevations that he referred to, um, this overtop said, 675.6, and then the top of this berm is at 677, almost a foot and a half higher. And it does drop down six feet to the lot line, as he, as he indicated, but it's over about 30 feet. So, uh, you know, we, knew, we recognize that there is, a, there is a drainage problem there. This will definitely help him on that, that situation. And how about in the northwest corner? Uh, the northwest corner is, is a much lesser extent. Uh, So it's a little bit dark, but once uh, once the road improvements go in, there's drainage swales along the roadway to intercept this drainage as it's flowing from east to west. So it won't be able to, it'll come down along the, the side of the road and then under the road into the basin. Uh, when you get over to this area, 
you put a building pad in here and then the front part of it will drain out towards the street so you really start to get a real small isolated area in the backyard and that's why we don't need such a deep swale back there and then as you move further north this shows the overall drainage for the watershed with green bay road and wesley and this is the property so a significant area is sort of coming through uh, from the northeast to the southwest. There is a smaller area, uh, 1.7 acres, up at the northwest corner. And once the property becomes developed, again, they'll have uh, the fronts of the house will drain out towards the, the street. And so you do end up with a small triangle up in the northwest corner of the property that drains to the west just like it does today uh, it's not an area that's buildable and so nothing's really changing and for us to go in there and to put a, a drainage swale to pick that small area up it means a lot of disruption with taking down a lot of trees and vegetation so that's what our thought was is uh, we thought that the vegetation and the screening in there served a better purpose than putting in a small swale that didn't pick up <coughs> much of an area can i ask you a question what is the five-foot easement that runs between the lots five and six? It says drainage easement? Yes, it's a drainage easement. What is that? Uh, it's, that's there if, uh, if needed to go ahead and allow drainage to come down the, down the side lot lines. Will that be installed? Um, yeah, well, I don't know how these houses are going to be built or what the footprint will look like or where the driveway would be. So um, those are things that would be considered in the grading plans for those lots. So all the water that's still coming from the east that runs perpendicular to your grading lines is still coming down on me. Well, I on the northwest corner up there, it's still going across. It's you a haven't disrupted it. You haven't changed it. The water's still running at me. It's a it's a triangle like that. Y yes. So the, I guess the question is, 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 is that all of the vegetation and the trees in there worth it's saving all, or? There's nothing worth saving in there. It's all garbage. You can look at your trees. You might have to step to the mic. Right. I can tell yeah. that dialogue. <clears throat> well, let me, <clears throat> is, <clears throat> let me see if I pick up the nature of the conversation. <clears throat> Mr. Bleck, are you saying that the drainage that goes through that triangle is going to be <clears throat> the same, approximately same, or different from what it is today. Would be no different than today. Be no different then. Right. Okay. So, <clears throat> Jason, property owner is asking for relief from what I guess I would call an existing condition. Am I correct in my assessment? What I believe he's saying. Uh, well, what he's asking is for us to divert water from where it's going today to another location. Yes. Okay. And I think just, just to clarify, if I understood you, that would require removal of existing vegetation, which would run counter to the concern expressed by the neighbor to the north to do everything we can to protect that existing privacy and in fact enhance it. So you have two. Yeah, I guess so I would take a look at the trees that are in there and see if it's if there's anything worth uh, salvaging or not that our thought process is what was at the time was that there was some vegetation in there that was serving a purpose and the the drainage that was going off onto that property was neg neg negligible, it was a really small amount. Uh, if those trees aren't of any value, to go in there and take them out and to put the ditch in is, is it's not a big deal. Uh, then you just have to go back and re-landscape it. But didn't you also say, Mike, that it's, I think the, you made a very good point that you don't know what's going to be built or how it's going to lay out on the what what house you're going to build, how it's going to lay out on the site. Right. So I think I, I don't know what kind of um, satisfaction we can give Howard on the fact that we don't know. I, I appreciate that you say that the ditch is, is not a it, not a big deal, but it's hard to say that that's what you're going to do if you don't know 
what what you're going to build on that on that lot, not that side, on that lot. Well, I don't know if you even need a ditch and a swale just to pick up the water that's coming through there. It doesn't have to be a big huge. But does that apply to the swale too? Then, if if we don't know what what you're going to build, what the house is going to be. Yeah. I think the that, water's coming through there anyways. It's all it's coming from Green Bay Road, whether or not the house is in there now or later, it doesn't matter. It's still coming in. Well, we're talking about Remedy, this, maybe. this triangle here, and there, there's two areas. This is 1.7 <coughs> acres and, and 0.27 acres. So, so two acres total. And of that two acres, you're talking about a, a little triangle up in the corner. So it, you're, it's, it's about a third of an acre, maybe, or something like that, is what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Further questions? On members of the commission? Mr. Swanson, do you want to have uh, petitioner's uh, rebuttal? Uh, actually, I, I don't have much to say. I, I think we've addressed uh, the issue of of uh, privacy on the wetland uh, adjacent to, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, is it, I didn't catch your name. Oh, Don McCoy. Don McCoy, thank you, Don. Um, I think we've addressed that by just simply removing that, that trail. As far as the drainage is concerned, I think we're dwelling too much on that issue. I would much rather preserve the tree stand along that edge. That 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 uh, drainage swale or that drainage easement that's provided between lot six and five, we're actually working with a, a, a couple right now on that lot. We're actually designing a house. I could tell you based on experience that we will ultimately have to put that drainage swale through there once the house goes in there and that will address any of the water that's going there. But to Mike, to Mr. Black's point, that triangle up in that corner isn't gonna change anything. And putting that swale in there isn't gonna make a whole lot of difference. The point be, being that that water isn't currently running onto that site. It's just that triangle that's affecting it. And that's a minimal amount compared to what, uh, what we experience on, on, well, we've heard enough, enough testimony tonight about everybody's drainage. I think you would agree this is a de minimis amount by comparison, especially in light of the work that Mr. Black has done on this. As far as the landscaping to the, uh, the north, that's a work in progress. We're open to discussion on it. Uh, obviously, uh, we, th there was a disconnect of some kind, but we're certainly willing to work with, uh, with these people. Um, there's just things here that we just anticipated when we, when we took over this project that were already approved. And we just assumed we were complying with all of those things when we did it. So for us to be kind of held to that, those new standards as we go forward makes it a little more difficult for us. But we're, as I said, Mr. Chairman, we're willing to consider any reasonable discussion uh, as long as it makes sense. But just the, just the landscape and additional landscaping just so we can have complete privacy from our adjacent property owners, it, it starts to get a little bit over the top. So we're, again, we're willing to work with, with folks. But we've already got an existing tree stand on that north boundary. Uh, I think it's a reasonable request for, Ms. for the uh, property owner to the east. And I think the, the wetland, and that's why I asked the question to, of Don earlier about where his property is. He got no neighbor there. There's no neighbor at that point. We're not gonna have any uh, pathway. It's just gonna be open space and wetland. So it's a, I would characterize that as a positive uh, a benefit. And Mr. Black pointed out that all that water is now diverted so that it's actually away from his driveway. So we're, we're, we're providing a significant benefit. So that's my rebuttal. And I appreciate giving me the opportunity. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Final questions from commission to either petitioner or staff. I, I get I guess I'm just I'm hung up. I know it's a small it's a small portion of that northeast corner, but what kind of remedy could we recommend? Northeast, northwest. 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 I'm sorry, thank you. <clears throat> the northwest I mean if, if we've already got plans, what what kind of remedy can we offer to to the I'm not sure we. I'm not sure we're obligated to offer. Yeah, that. I know we're not obligated, but is there a thought? Yeah. Are you so is that the talking thought? about with respect to drainage? Yeah. Keep in mind that before a building permit is issued for any house, detailed right. grading and drainage plans need to be submitted, and those will be reviewed by the city engineer. Certainly in the context of this subdivision, but also within the context of what is now proposed for that lot. So. Um, it, it's not as though this is the last look at drainage. I guess I'm just offering that. 
<clears throat> but will the, will the matter have to go before the Building Review Board and will the adjacent property owner have an opportunity to be heard? Uh, a subdivision like this wouldn't necessarily have to go before the Building Review Board, um, and the Building Review Board doesn't deal with drainage. Drainage okay. is dealt with by the city engineer. Um, to follow up on some other issues, I, I would suggest that you add a condition that at the time plans are submitted uh, for development of these specific properties, um, I think it's, it's lots uh, five and six, that particular attention be paid to the perimeter landscaping to the north and the east. I would uh, ask unanimous consent to add that <clears throat> screening uh, review on lots five and six uh, on the perimeter uh, as the site plans come in, or when the site plans come in. So does that become the responsibility of the individual property purchaser for the lot or the developer to put the landscaping in? Well, there's, there's landscaping that occurs as part of the overall subdivision, but with every house, there are landscape obligations that come specifically with the development of the lot. Okay, uh, all right. So in, 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 with regard to the buffer to the neighbor, is that something that we should have as part of the subdivision landscaping master plan? What I heard Kathy say, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this would be a condition <clears throat> of the plan commission, assuming approved by the council, that would direct the <clears throat> city engineer to review as part of the review process to, to, to make sure that's taken into account. The, the landscaping would actually be reviewed by the city arborist, but I think uh -oh. there's some, some value in certainly preserving what's there um, and evaluating it at the time a specific site plan comes in so you know where the house is sited, where the driveway is sited, where the garage is sited, and how that uh, may warrant enhanced landscaping or uh, so it seems that specific detailed uh, lands those specific detailed landscape decisions are most appropriately made once we know what's happening with each individual site in those cases so to answer guys question it would be the lot owners responsibility Please respond, uh, Rick. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the reason that perimeter landscaping is in there so that we can screen the proposed houses, that's the bottom line. The only reason anybody wants that landscaping is there is because when those houses go in, they want to make sure that they don't see them. It's an unusual, it's not an unusual request. I, I get it a lot in this community, but the reality is I, I'm working with people on lot five, is it, is, is, Mike, is the top lot up there five or six? Five. Which is the, the property that uh, is between uh, Mr. Gillette's property and, and, um, and the proposed house. And I think Mr. Gillette will tell you that his primary concern is he really doesn't want to see the house. And I don't, I don't fault him for that. I mean, that's a concern I typically hear. But that can be addressed when, we, when that property owner is in there. Right now, it's kind of nice to look out at this property. It's actually very attractive. I can understand what we're doing here, but it seems to be almost overkill to have to put all this landscaping in now just so we can basically screen open field. When we do build the houses, we will have to come in and submit grading plans. And as Ms. Uh, Cerniak pointed out, we're gonna have to, to submit landscape plans as well, especially if, it's, if there's a screening issue. 
We're very happy to address it at that time. Rick, are you planning on building all these houses? I'm designing the houses, but we are in control of the construction. And just to clarify, there's really two pieces of landscaping. You have a landscape plan in your packet that shows the landscaping related to the subdivision. That involves all the landscaping around the ponds, adjacent to Mr. McCoy's property, on the east property. When we talked before about lots five and six, we recognized that there already is some substantial plantings al along that north and uh, westerly boundary, lots five and six. And those are the areas that, although there was some infill proposed, it really makes sense to see what's proposed on those two properties, understand what the existing vegetation is, and then accordingly enhance that buffer area. So yes, there absolutely is landscaping that will go in as part of the subdivision, mm -hmm. but there's more that will go in and that the city can require as part of the development approvals of each individual lot. Uh, that sounds great to me. Yeah, me yeah. too. I just wanted to hear it stated thusly, <coughs> and it has been. I frankly think it's a better control, actually. It's a better Fine. result. It's a better I, result. I, yeah. I got it. It's been it's been. Do we still need the condition, though, in terms of uh, five and six? I think in light of the concerns that have been ra raised by uh, Mr. Gillette and Mr. I saw no Elias, objection to my uh, asking unanimous consent. So no objection. So ordered. Okay. Okay, um, what's the pleasure of the commission? We have uh, a staff report and then we have pages two and three of that report are kind of shaded. Uh, this is the recommendation to approve with conditions as modified by the most recent screening on lots five and six. May I just for one minute? Please come up and state your question. I apologize. Uh, I think that uh, maybe voting on this thing is just a little bit premature, at least without putting in a condition that uh, we have to come to an agreement on uh, what's going to be along my lot line and uh, you know this whole thing it seems that everything that was agreed to at the last meeting was just forgotten about nobody did anything on well, it. well I, I disagree with that yeah. uh no i mean sir the path is already gone the path is gone <laughs> yeah. uh, the path is gone i heard it in the public but testimony here by mr black that it, there is no path there uh it showed on my drawing but he on, testified in open public session and showed a revised map in which the path is along the way that you're concerned about is not there. Okay, and, and the screening that w they promised to put in and... Uh, the review of the downstream culverts and the way the water is flowing down there. What, what I'd like to do is just the condition that he has to get with me and we have to add the additional information of what he's going to do to my property there. Because I still have this big berm that we're putting up that people can still get up on there. And I have no objection to paying for the screening. It's just that I can't put it on my property because I don't have that much there. You know, if he says, oh, you know, but you pay for the screening. I'll pay for it. Did you say you'll pay for it? Sure, I'll pay for the screening. Well, you, you know, that, that's a small thing. <laughs> you probably should have kept this in your seat. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. People Chairman? You see that there's a conversation and that this plan is modified to show you specifically what's, what's planned along that detention area. Right, or, or and I'm sure area. we can negotiate it and get the things so we'll it works sure for him and them. We can make part of our approval that staff will coordinate those issues. Is that that will be satisfactory? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay. If there's any further debate on the uh, approving the staff recommendation with the conditions mentioned and as discussed. None. None. Okay. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. I'll, I'll make the motion. I'm sorry. That's all right. I second it. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, 
that the matter be a final plat be approved with the conditions on pages two and three. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries. The final plat is approved. Okay, the uh, <clears throat> item number four, public hearing in action, that item on the Ellawa Farm Master Plan has been, uh, was postponed. <clears throat> so, uh, any uh, public testimony on non-agenda items? Seeing none, additional information from staff? Nothing further. Fine, thank you very much. Uh, motion to adjourn is in order. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carried. Thank mm -hmm. you.